Okay, members, um, if we would now move to consideration stage, the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill and uh, the, uh, the consideration stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, I now call the Minister for Justice, Mrs Naomi Long, to move the bill. I move that the consideration stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill be now taken. Okay, by way of explanation in regard to grouping of the amendments, members will have a copy of the marshalled list of amendments detailing the order for consideration. The amendments have been grouped for debate in the provisional grouping of amendments selected list. Members should note that the marshalled list is dated for the 17th of November and both it and the grouping list supersede the ones issued for the postponed debate on the 10th of November. Members will have received both printed and electronic copies of the documents, but additional printed copies are available out in the rotunda if needed for the debate. By way of explanation of the groupings, there are four groups of amendments, and we will debate the amendments in each group in turn. The first debate will be on amendments 1 to 8, 10, 16, 17, and opposition to clause 3 stand part, which deal with the information on the offence. Within this group, Amendment 7 is mutually exclusive to Amendments 5 and 6. The second debate will be on Amendments 9 and 11 to 14, which deal with additional protection for children as well as support for victims of domestic abuse. The third debate will be on Amendments 15 and 18 to 26, which deal with the implementation and operation of the offence. Within this group, Amendment 15 and Amendment 21 are mutually exclusive. There are three amendments to amendments 20 to up to amendment 22, and amendment 22 is an amendment to amendment 21, and then amendments 25 and 26 are amendments to amendment 24. If you've got all that. So. The, the fourth debate will be on amendments 27 to 34, which deal with measures for civil court proceedings. I would remind members intending to speak that during the debates on the four groups of amendments, they should address all of the amendments within each group on which they wish to comment. Once the debate on each group is completed, any further amendments in the group will be moved formally as we go through the bill, and the question on each will be put without further debate. The questions on stand part will be taken at the appropriate points in the bill. If that is clear, we shall proceed. Uh, group 1 amendments, then, information on the offence. We now come to the first group of amendments for debate. With Amendment 1, it will be convenient to debate Amendments 2 to 8, 10, 16, 17, and opposition to Clause 3 stand part. I now call Mr Jim Allister to move Amendment 1 and to address the other amendments in the group. I beg to move Amendment number 1. Okay. Um, I now call the chairperson of the Committee for Justice, Mr. Paul. Oh, sorry, excuse, excuse me, Mr. Alistair. Sorry, moved too quick there. <laughs> okay, beg your pardon. I call Mr. Alistair then. Advised. Um, when the Attorney General, uh, the uh, recently retired Attorney General, Mr. John Larkin, give evidence to the committee. Uh, he said, good law is clear law and straightforward law. Now, I would like this House to remember that in debating these issues today. Good law is clear law and straightforward law. And when we come to Clause 1, we are, of course, in the business of creating a criminal offence. And a criminal offence is normally expected to have certain clear component parts. In any law school, probably the first lecture or the first tutorial for a criminal law student is on this very subject. What is it that comprises a criminal offence? And the law student will be told that to any criminal offence, there are two key components. 
There is what in the law is called the mens rea, that's to say the guilty mind, and there is the actus reus, that is to say the act that does the harm. And those two phrases are not just obscure Latin phrases plucked out of long ago. Well, they are plucked out from long ago. They actually originate from just over 400 years ago when the famous jurist, Sir Edward Coke, who went on to become Chief Justice of England, expounded the phrase that a criminal offence involves both the actus reus and the mens rea. So when we come to look at clause one and the creation of this criminal offence, I invite the House to look and to examine the mens rea and the actus reus of this offence. Well, the mens rea is quite straightforward. It's in 1, 2, B, that A intends the course of behaviour to cause B to suffer physical or psychological harm, etc. That's the guilty mind. That's the intent. That's the mens rea. But when we come to the actus reus of this offence, we're in much greater obscurity and difficulty. And we're in that obscurity and difficulty, even though the offence is titled the domestic abuse offence, which naturally would cause you to think that what we're therefore looking for here is actual domestic abuse. But we discover quite remarkably when we read this offence, clause 1, subsection 2, where it says, well, first of all, 1.1 one, one says a person commits an offence if he engages in a course of behaviour that is abusive of another person. That's not difficult. A, or a and B are personally connected to each other at the time. That's not difficult. Both of the further conditions are met. And here they come. That a reasonable person would consider the course of behaviour to be likely to cause B to suffer physical or psychological harm. You will note it does not say that the further conditions are that B suffers physical or psychological harm. It is that a reasonable person would consider them to be likely to suffer physical or psychological harm. And you cannot read this without reading Clause 3 as well, which takes us to the point we're saying the domestic abuse offence can be committed whether or not A's behaviour actually causes B to suffer harm of the sort referred to in section 1-2. That, I suggest to this House, is quite remarkable, that you can create a criminal offence without there actually being any harm. You call it domestic abuse, but you don't have to prove any harm. Let's take any other offence. Let's take the offence of theft. Theft is defined as the dishonest, that's part of the mens rea, appropriation of the property belonging to another with the intention of permanently repriving. So the mens rea is the dishonest way with the intention of permanently depriving. The actus reus is the taking of property belonging to another. It has got the two components. It doesn't say you can commit theft without taking. But apparently you can commit abuse without causing harm. Take the offence of murder. Yes, certainly. 
Um, I mean, I'm loath to interject um, on members because I realise um, that you're building your case and I don't want to disrupt that. But I would, I would say to the member, in terms of the mens rea, the Act has to be with the intent um, or reckless to it. So we're accepting, and I think we both agree, um, that that is the case. The actus reus in this case is that there is a course of action, a course of behaviour that is established. The harm is the outcome, the potential outcome of that course of behaviour. But the action will have taken place whether or not the harm is caused. In the same way that, for example, if someone chooses uh, to drink um, under the influence of alcohol um, and they don't cause any harm, they still have committed an offence which is reckless to the harm that it might cause. And so it is not as clear cut as the member is suggesting. I respectfully disagree. I believe it is exactly as clear cut as what I'm suggesting. Because the course of behaviour, yes, the course of behaviour, but it has to have a product. Theft has to have a product. Take homicide. What is homicide? It's the unlawful killing with the intent to kill or to cause grievous bodily harm. That's the mens rea, intent to kill or cause GBH. But the actus reus is the, the product, is the killing. The actus reus is the product. Where is the product here? We're expressly told in Clause 3 there doesn't have to be any product. Now, that is something which I find astounding, that you can create an offence where the person, yes, they must have the intent, they must have the guilty mind, they must want to do it, but if they fail, if they fail to cause harm, no matter how much they wanted to try to cause harm, they are still guilty as if they had caused the harm. How could that be right? How, in a moment, how could that be right? And the premise upon which they would be guilty is because some mythical, reasonable person says that they would consider their behavior likely to cause harm. Sorry, it's not what your neighbor thinks or what someone else thinks, or some reasonable man thinks. The fundamental question is, was there harm? If there was no harm, it might be utterly reprehensible behavior. The intent might be odious. It clearly is. But there is no harm. And yet the law here is trying to say, never mind that. Without harm, you can be guilty as if you created harm. Well, I was to give one down here, so if it's still time. I thank the member for giving way. I, I just want some clarification, and I really would have appreciated, to be honest with you, if, if the member would have come and made some of these arguments to us as members of the committee, as Rachel Woods did around her amendments, as the minister and her officials did around their amendments, because it's helpful to be able to have these questions and these conversations before we get to this point. But I'm, I'm wondering, just in the analogy that the minister used around the drink driving, what's, where is the harm where the drink driver has not actually done harm, but they have still drove whilst over the legal limit for, for drive? Sir, um, I did make these points at the second stage debate, so the committee had the opportunity to hear them. Uh, and um, if I'd been invited, I would have gladly expounded on them further. The drink driver. The offence is quite clearly. The act is reus is the act of driving. The act of driving itself an inherently dangerous th thing because of the drink involved, because of the risk involved. So that is intertwined in the act of driving. But when you say we're going to create an offence of domestic abuse, then surely it is as night follows day, you look to see what abuse was caused, what harm was caused. And when you look, you have a blank page here. 
And in fact, not just a bank page, you're told you don't need anything on the page. You don't need any harm. Now, let me just develop this point, if I might, before I take a further intervention. So we have a situation. Let's say it's a man. It doesn't have to be a man. But let's say it's a man intends the most horrible abuse of his wife, his partner, or whoever. But his wife and his partner suffers no harm. Some might say, well, then should he walk away? No. The law has covered that. The law provides the offence of attempt. And under the um, criminal appeals, criminal attempts and conspiracy order of 1983, it says, if with intent to commit an offence to which this article applies, a person does an act which is more than merely preparatory to the commission of the offence, he is guilty of attempting to commit the offence. A person may be guilty. A, a, this article applies to any offence which, if it were completed, would be triable in Northern Ireland. And for such an offence, a person guilty of attempt shall be liable on conviction to the same penalty he would have had if, he'd been, if he had committed the actual offence. So here you have the answer already provided in the law. If someone attempts to abuse their wife, they have the intent to abuse their wife, they could either be charged in the first place with attempting, or they could be found guilty, having been charged with the actual abuse of merely the attempt. But on either, they, get, they can get the same penalty. We're talking here about a fence which can, re which can reap 14 years in jail. You can reap 14 years in jail for the same attempted offence. So why are we in the business of, of corrupting the law by taking out of this offence the very core of what is the offence and saying no harm required still an offence. He might have failed in his mission, still guilty. That's like saying the thief went to steal, but he wasn't able to steal anything. But he's still guilty of theft. Yes, he's guilty of attempted theft. And that's what the law already provides. But he's not guilty of theft. By the same token, the miscreant husband who seeks to abuse his wife, who has that necessary intent, but fails to cause harm, fails to cause physical or psychological harm, he can still be guilty of the attempt, but he cannot be guilty of the actuality that he never obtained. That's the distinction. And that's why I say to pretend that he's in the same position as if he had actually created the harm is a corruption of the very components of what is a criminal offence. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Alistair. Um, at lunchtime today, I took a phone call from a lady who was in a mother and baby home years ago. She's hit 60 now. And at the time when she escaped from the mother and baby home, she was just delighted to get out of, her, out of the place. And it was years later that she recognised the abuse, emotional abuse that she suffered and she didn't really feel the harm at that point. But now she's 60 and she is in a dreadful state. Are you saying that the abuse, now it's a slightly different context, but are you saying that because she didn't recognise the harm at that point, but recognises it years later, that it didn't take place? No, I'm absolutely not saying that. My amendment says that I want to make the offence in 1-2 that B suffers physical and psychological harm. If that lady suffered psychological harm, then there is the essential component of the offence. And there is no limitation in these matters. So she suffered psychological harm. That meets with what I am saying in the amendment. It can be physical, it can be psychological, but this bill says it need be nothing. 
Nothing. Yes? I, I thank the member for giving way, um, and he is being very generous with his time. The purpose here is not to criminalise the attempt of abuse, the course of action of behaviour. The course of action of behaviour will have happened. This is not someone who attempted a course of action and was not able to complete it. This is somebody who undertook a course of action, a real course of action, like the person who drinks alcohol and gets behind the wheel of their car. So they made that decision, reckless to the harm it might cause, indifferent to the harm it might cause, or in full knowledge of the harm it might cause. The fact that they did not cause harm is not the, the fundamental issue. The fact is that they commissioned a course of action and completed it. And that is the test that the abuse offence has, has, has happened. The issue of harm is secondary and is one that would be considered at the point of sentencing in terms of a judge deciding how serious or otherwise the offence might be. So the member has recognised that by bringing together the drinking of alcohol and the driving of a car, you create a risk. It is exactly the same when a person commits a course of action and finishes that course of action to cause harm. And as my colleague has already said, it may be many years before the person subject to that course of action realises the harm that it has done. But it may be possible in advance of that for a reasonable person to recognise that that course of action could cause harm. With respect, where I think the minister is falling into error is this, that if she says the key issue here is the course of behaviour, then why do we have one, two at all? If that's the offence, a course of behaviour, then why do we say, with further conditions, a reasonable person would consider the course of behaviour to be likely to cause physical or psychological harm? In saying that, the minister has embraced the need for harm, and she's filling the vacuum of the lack of harm by putting it on the shoulders of a reasonable person and getting out of, of the finding of harm by saying, but a reasonable person would think it's harm. You can't have it both ways. You can't say this offence is about a course of action. End off. And then say, but we need to tick a box about causing harm, so we'll tick it by having some reasonable person say it would be likely to cause harm. Either it causes harm or it doesn't. And that's the fundamental choice for this House. Are we going to create an offence which causes harm or not? And certainly, causing harm is the essence of any offence, of violence, or abuse, or anything else. And you cannot say we duck, we dodge that by simply saying, Ah, well, never mind, there was no harm, but any reasonable person would think there would have been harm. Would have been isn't good enough, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Should have been isn't good enough. It has to be the causing of harm. And if it's not the causing of harm, it could still be the attempt to cause harm. Yes, I give way to Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for his contribution. I am somewhat sympathetic to the points he makes, and I'll come to that in my own contribution later. In this case, would we have to define what harm is, given that coercive control as a criminal offence is, is a relatively new concept? So who decides what is harm if, if we were to put forward what his amendment suggests? I would also ask, because we are creating a, 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 a criminal offence here, it will have a practical outworking. So when this goes through the criminal justice process, how do you see, as it's currently drafted, Mr Alistair, given your previous experience, this being successful of seeking a conviction in court? Well, two, two points. Uh, the first one's a bit shorter than the second, so I'll take it first. Uh, my amendment suggests that you must the bee must suffer physical and psychological harm. Uh, so that's a jury question. Did the, did the victim suffer harm? That can be physical, it could be the broken arm, it could be the torturous mind that Ms. Bradshaw referred to. It can be either. Uh, 
It's a question of fact. Did they or did they not suffer harm? If they suffer harm and they have the guilty mind, the offence is complete. The second question is, if we leave this offence as drafted, what prospect is there of any jury ever convicting anyone? My goodness. So you're going to say to a jury of 12 people, we want you to convict Mr. X because he intended harm, abuse, towards Mrs. X, but he failed in causing harm to Mrs. X. But never mind that, you convict him anyway. I wouldn't like to be the prosecutor that would have to put that case to a jury. I'd love to be the defense counsel that had to answer that case. It is so preposterous a suggestion to say that you should invite a jury to convict on the basis of, here's a victim with no harm, but because he wanted harm, in a moment, because he wanted harm, he intended harm, and you might think there should have been harm, then we don't have to prove there was harm. And that for an offence for which you can get 14 years? Really, I don't think that's a prospect that this Assembly should entertain, particularly when it knows, particularly when it knows that the attempt offence is always there. It's always an alternative under the Criminal Law Act of 67. It can be an offence in its own right under the uh, Criminal Attempts and Conspiracy Order of 83. It's there either way. So why on earth would we create an offence of this sort? I might recall in the second stage debate, we were told this was all modelled on the Scottish. So I wrote to the Scottish Justice Minister and I asked effectively what success they had had in getting convictions with no harm, whether no harm was caused, have his reply. He had to tell me they don't have any statistics like that. I'm not surprised. Do you really think, members of this House, do you really think that any jury is going to be impressed to the point of being satisfied? beyond all reasonable doubt that an offence has been committed where there's no manifest harm, no claim of harm. It's not that somebody's saying, oh, I, I do feel psychologically damaged or I did have a broken wrist. And it's a question of fact whether that's right or wrong. It's not even that case. It's whether or not there was, you don't need any harm, as long as a reasonable person would think there should have been harm. It's beggar's belief, I think, that would be contemplating that. Yep. I thank the member for giving way again, and I appreciate that the member has outlined his position very clearly. But can the member account for conditioning of victims by coercive and psychological coercive control and psychological abuse not to recognise behaviour that has occurred? And to a practical question to Mr. Alistair, given his in, in, inherent experience, is there a requirement for B in this in this case where A is the perpetrator and B is the victim to recognise or claim the harm caused for prosecution? Not as drafted. I don't think there is. Uh, I think you probably could bring a prosecution on this as drafted without B ever being a complainant or B ever giving evidence, I suspect, because you're, you're depending on the mythical reasonable man. Let's call the reasonable man. We needn't bother calling the victim. They don't matter here. It's the reasonable man. That's how preposterous this is. Um, so, sure. 
and I, I, I do intend to cover all of these uh, in terms of how the committee did consider it, because obviously the member made this point earlier in proceedings. The committee engaged extensively on the points that were raised uh, and reached a considered view on it, uh, and I'll elaborate on that. But ju just to deal, the, the member for East Londonderry asked for the definition of harm. Uh, if the member refers to clause 1 3, psychological harm, and it's not exclusive to, but it, it, it includes, including fear, alarm, and distress. So there is commentary in the bill as to, to what that harm is. And it, the offence is also around the aspect of the course of behaviour. Uh, and again, clause 4.4, 4, a course of behaviour involves behaviour on at least two occasions. So it's not the one-off event um, wh which you know, members are concerned about. This is a course of behaviour. Uh, and the committee did also look at the, the abused who has been institutionalised to the point of this is normal behaviour. Uh, and that is something that we considered. We also looked at what are the protections given what the member has said. And obviously he will know around the PPS and the public interest tests and evidential tests that would be required before you would end up taking the case. We also looked at clause 12, which talks about uh, the defence around reasonableness, which of course some people didn't want in, but we've looked at this bill in the round, uh, and that's where we reached a position in respect of all of this. But, uh, I intend to cover that in much more detail whenever I get to my own contributions. I simply make the point, why would we want to go round the houses on all those pedantics when the answer lies in the existing law, namely the alternative prosecution for or the alternative conviction of attempt? Why would you want to create this mythical situation when you could very simply charge attempted abuse, and because you haven't got a victim who claims abuse, you can acquire the conviction. Yes? The member continues to make the mistake of conflating attempt with no harm. This is not about someone who attempted and failed to abuse another person. This is about somebody who undertook a course of action which a reasonable person would believe was abusive. And it is not unusual in law for a reasonable person test to be applied. And as the chairman of the committee has rightly said, that, that includes at the point where the PPS make a decision whether or not to prosecute. But the key issue here that is not about attempt, because we're not saying that the person in this case did not actually complete the course of action. They did. The question lies as to whether or not that course of action, which we believe should be criminalised, has caused harm, and that is a different question. To the central point that you're invite, the Minister is inviting the Assembly to create a criminal offence where the critical component of the actus reus causing harm is absent. Clause 3 couldn't be clearer. The domestic abuse offence can be committed whether or not the behaviour, the course of behaviour, actually causes harm. So it's there in lights. It's there in lights. You don't have to cause harm to be convicted of causing harm. That's the essence of it. Because what is domestic abuse? But surely, harm, you can't say domestic abuse is some, something out in the ether. It's real. Except when you get to the Crown Court, when it doesn't have to be real in terms of harm. It can be mythical. It can be mythical provided a reasonable man says, ah, oh, but it should have caused harm. Really? I really do think this House needs to examine, and that's why I wasn't surprised to read that the, law, that the Bar Council cautioned about the objective test, uh, caused you, said you should consider if the offence should in fact require harm to be, I told you reliance on the objective test is problematic. All those points were raised with the committee, and yet we arrived today where we started, with an attempt 
to push through the novelty of an offence without the essential component of the actus res. Guilty minds enough is really what we're saying here. A guilty mind, I respectfully suggest to you, can never be enough to convict anyone of a serious offence or any offence beyond all reasonable doubt. And this is an offence for which the awaiting sentence can be 14 years. I really do say to this House, we need to pause. And there's nothing to lose by putting into this clause Amendment Number 1, which requires harm or psychological harm, and taking out Clause 3, which is the one that really does distort the whole issue of the essence of criminality, the mens rea and the actus rea. Mr. Speaker, those are my points, and uh, I put them before the House. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Allister, and I call Paul Gibbon. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. And just before addressing the amendments, with your indulgence, Mr. Speaker, I wish to make some general remarks about the bill in my capacity as Chairman uh, of the uh, Committee for Justice. Uh, the Committee supports this bill including the creation of a new domestic abuse offence to cover psychological abuse as well as physical abuse, which is just as harmful, if not more so, as committee members heard directly from victims, the aggravator clauses and the associated changes to improve criminal procedures, evidence and sentencing in domestic abuse-related cases. The committee also supports a number of amendments being brought forward by the Minister today, and the committee has, br er, and has brought forward six other amendments uh, to improve the legislation. Uh, during the debate at second stage on the principles of the bill, I outlined that in the uh, 12 months from the 1st of January 2019 to the 31st of December 2019, police service statistics indicated that the highest number of domestic abuse crimes in any 12-month period had been recorded since 2004-05, and the number of crimes had increased by nearly 15% on the previous 12 months. More recently, during the COVID-19 lockdown, in March onwards, domestic violence and abuse incidents to police increased by around 15 per cent compared to calls for the same period in the previous year. Cases involving domestic abuse generally account for nearly 20 per cent of the public prosecution service caseload each year, and in the past financial year, the PPS has issued just over 8,000 decisions in cases involving domestic abuse. These figures are staggering and clearly illustrate the need for this legislation, which is long overdue. Domestic abuse can affect anyone, regardless of gender, age, class or sexual orientation, and it should never be excused or tolerated. Upon the restoration of the Assembly in January, one of the first things that I did along with the Deputy Chair of the Committee, Linda Dillon, was to encourage the Minister to bring this legislation through the Assembly rather than continuing to use the domestic abuse bill that was going through Westminster as the legislative vehicle, and I am very pleased that the Minister agreed to do so. This has enabled the provisions of the bill to be scrutinised in depth and has provided the opportunity for the statutory and voluntary organisations and, most importantly, those who have suffered domestic abuse to have a voice in shaping the legislation and ensuring it meets the specific needs of Northern Ireland. I know that while this approach was widely welcomed, there was some concern that it would take longer to get the legislation passed. The Committee, however, prioritised the Bill, and I am very pleased that it is on track to complete its passage through this Assembly ahead of the Westminster Bill. As well as the main clauses of the Bill and a wide range of related amendments, the Committee also considered the need for effective implementation of the legislation and a range of other issues relating to domestic abuse highlighted in the evidence that we received that were not covered through the legislation. One of the consistent themes running through the evidence the Committee received related to the importance of ensuring the legislation, once passed, is implemented properly and effectively. I will return to these whenever we debate the Group 3 amendments. 
a wide range of other issues relating to the domestic abuse offence and the provision of support and assistance to victims not currently covered in the Bill were brought to the Committee's attention and the need for progress in these areas in conjunction with the legislation was repeatedly emphasised. Some of the issues require legislative provision, while others are operational in nature. Some of the issues also fall within the responsibilities of ministers other than the Minister of Justice, highlighting the fact that a number of departments, including the Department of Health, the Department of Communities and the Department of Education, have a role to play in supporting victims of domestic abuse, and it requires a cross-departmental response rather than simply a justice response. The distinct criminal justice purposes of this Bill limited the opportunity to take many of the aspects that require legislative provision forward. However, the Committee intends to continue to make domestic violence and abuse one of its key priorities and will continue to consider the issues in that context. The Committee has also brought forward amendments to progress two of the issues, and again I will return to these later in the debate. Given the interest in this Bill and the wish of the Committee to ensure the legislation is as robust as possible, the Committee spent considerable time undertaking detailed scrutiny and sought a wide range of views to assist its deliberations. Written evidence was sought from interested organisations, and the views of victims of domestic violence and abuse were particularly welcomed by the Committee. We used four different social media platforms. Uh, the Assembly blog, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all to raise awareness of and engage with the public by disseminating information on the Bill using a range of methods, including text, graphics and videos. The Committee received 66 written submissions from organisations, including the Committee for Health and the Committee for Communities, who both provided very helpful written comments on aspects of the Bill and other issues relevant to their respective departments and from the Minister of Health. Eleven oral evidence sessions were held with a range of organisations, and the issues raised in the evidence received were explored with the Department of Justice and the Police Service, both in writing and through oral briefings. The Committee also discussed the legislation with representatives from the Public Prosecution Service, given it, together with the PSNI, will be responsible for applying this new legislation. Several research papers were also commissioned to assist the Committee's consideration of specific issues and we sought further clarification and information from the Department for the Economy and the Department for Communities on specific issues that fall within their responsibility. The Committee received written views from 45 individuals, many outlining their personal experiences of domestic abuse, and the Committee held nine private, informal meetings with a number of individuals to discuss their personal experiences of domestic abuse and their views on the legislation. To assist scrutiny of the technical aspects of the Bill, the Committee also sought advice from the Examiner of Statutory Rules on the range of powers within the Bill to make subordinate legislation and received legal advice on issues relating to Clause 10 in respect of legislative competence. So, Mr. Speaker, the Committee considered the provisions of the Bill and, to, uh, and potential amendments at no less than 17 meetings before agreeing its report on the Committee stage of the Bill at our meeting held on the 15th of October. And I want to thank the members of the Committee for their contributions uh, to the detailed, robust and careful scrutiny of this Bill and the issues that were raised in the evidence during the Committee stage. For a number of members, this was their first Bill that they have had to consider, and they showed a forensic attention to detail. And the Committee members showed a collegiate approach. We debated, debated robustly the issues, and then we reached consensus. And it is through the strength of the Committee and that unity of purpose that there are amendments that are being passed today when they will be voted on later, because of that work across the different members, across the different political parties. And all of this, in terms of the scrutiny work, was achieved despite the restrictions that COVID-19 has placed upon this Assembly and members and our ability to gather evidence. I might be biased as Chairman of the Committee, but I believe the Justice Committee is an exemplar to other committees in this Assembly. It is the engine room for the changes that take place when it comes to legislation, and I thank all of the members for the way in which they approached this piece of legislation. There is no doubt that the Committee considered all aspects of the Bill the range of proposed amendments and the other issues brought to our attention in a full and thorough manner. 
I also want to thank all the organisations who provided very helpful written and oral evidence and the de departmental officials who provided additional information and clarification throughout the process. But most importantly, I want to place on record the Committee's thanks and appreci appreciation to those individuals who responded in writing, and indeed some that met privately with Committee members and shared their personal experiences of domestic abuse. We know how difficult it was to relive those experiences but their contributions greatly assisted the Committee in understanding the insidious nature of coercive and controlling behaviour and the impact of domestic violence and abuse, not only on the victim, but their children and wider family. The Committee Mr. Speaker, also appreciates the support and assistance provided by Assembly staff, including the researchers, the legal adviser, the examiner of statutory rules, the communications and broadcasting staff, indeed the staff from Hansard, and in particular the bill clerk, they all play, uh, who played an important role in supporting the committee to undertake its legislative scrutiny role in general and the committee stage of this bill in particular. I also want to commend our own committee staff, led by Christine Dara, a gem within this assembly that we are proud to have supporting our committee. Christine has been there uh, from the start of devolution of justice. I have had the opportunity now to work with her on this my second occasion as chairman of the committee, but I want to place on record my appreciation for her work and dedication and that of her team in supporting committee members. Moving to the amendment to clause 1 that has been brought forward by Mr Allister and his opposition to clause 3, there is overwhelming support for the new offence that is provided for by clauses 1 to 4 amongst the organisations and individuals who submitted evidence to the committee with many of the view that it better reflects the realities of how domestic abuse is experienced and will better protect victims of domestic abuse. The Women's Aid Federation believes that, a, that an offence that includes coercive control will lead to a criminal justice system which more accurately reflects the realities of domestic violence and abuse. Relate NI particularly welcomed the reasonable person test as a means of adjudicating whether or not an offence is committed. Victim Support NI supports the framing of Clause 3 and that the offence can be deemed to have been committed regardless of whether the behaviour has been proven to have had a particular effect and agrees with the view of the Men's Advisory Project that proof of the act of carrying out the abusive behaviour should be sufficient without also having to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the abuse had a particular impact. The Probation Board also welcomes the recognition that, a, that an offence can be committed regardless of whether harm was actually caused and that the provisions will apply where the behaviour of the alleged perpetrator was intentional or reckless to its effect. The Public Prosecution Service stated in its evidence to the, to the Committee that the new offence means that it will now have the ability to prosecute perpetrators for the more subtle forms of controlling behaviours which previously have fallen short of a criminal offence yet are common in cases of domestic abuse received by them. It supports the wording of clauses 1 and 2 and also notes that clause 3 will ensure that perpetrators cannot take advantage of the resilience or acceptance of an abusive situation. A number of organisations did raise some issues regarding the framing of the new offence with the committee. In relation to clause 1, Evangelical Alliance noting that the offence can be committed regardless of whether or not harm is actually caused to an individual was concerned that if there was a lack of safeguards, the legislation could be used maliciously or vindictively by either partner in a difficult or toxic relationship, and also sought assurances that it would not be inadvertently applied to unintended situations or personal di disagreements that do not amount to domestic abuse. The Bar of Northern Ireland also commented on the proposed reasonable person test and the fact that psychological harm includes fear, alarm and distress with no requirement to demonstrate the actual impact on the victim and stated that this is a low bar and potentially gives considerable discretion to the PPS in making decisions around which complaints should be prosecuted. It also highlighted that when coupled with the broad list of family members in Clause 5, this would potentially allow a considerable range of behaviours in intimate and family relationships to fall under the ambit of the legislation. The bar did, however, recognise 
that there is a fine balance which must be struck between ensuring the safe prosecution of alleged perpetrators of domestic abuse and at the same time ensuring that the victims of domestic abuse do not endure further trauma as part of a criminal trial by having to prove to the court that the behaviour has caused them psychological harm and it appreciated that the rationale behind the legislation is a genuine attempt to improve the operation of the system and recognises the very difficult experiences of victims. The Bar also commented specifically on Clause 3 and indicated that it seemed possible that the absence of a requirement to show harm could arise in cases where a person is not the instigator of the complaint, where they are in fact not harmed, and where the person does not themselves consider the conduct abusive, and in these instances, employing an objective test may cause difficulty. The Bar questioned whether consideration should be given to whether the offence should, should in fact require evidence of harm, which Mr Allister's amendment is addressing today. Mr Allister also drew the attention of the committee to correspondence between him and the Scottish Justice Secretary, and to which he has referred to in his opening remarks, and highlighted that any suggestion that there had been successful prosecutions in Scotland where no actual harm was caused is not borne out by actual data. So when considering clauses one to four, the committee took account of the evidence of the department, which I'm sure the minister will cover in detail later in this debate. And in particular, the offence operates on the basis of checks and balances, and it will have to be considered that abusive behaviour has taken place for the offence to apply. The behaviour must occur on two or more occasions, be considered abusive with a range of effects that have been set out, be considered by a reasonable person to be such, be likely to cause the person to suffer physical or psychological harm, and the offender intends to cause harm or is reckless as to this. The test for prosecution, including the public interest test, will also have to be met and further safeguards in terms of the defence on grounds of reasonableness provided for by Clause 12, which the Committee considered in detail and which we support, as it provides the necessary balance given the scope of the new offence and the wide personal connection uh, will apply. The Committee also sought further information and clarification in relation to Clause 3, and in particular, the no requirement to cause harm aspect of the provision from the Department. Officials outlined that the provisions focus on the actions of the perpetrator and the intention to cause harm or be reckless as to this, and the purpose of Clause 3 is to ensure that a case can be taken forward where an individual may have suffered considerable abuse over a period of time, but due to the extent and nature of uh, the abuse, the behaviour has become normalised or the person has become resilient to the abuse. As a result of this, the person may not necessarily be of the view that harm has been caused to them, but a reasonable person looking at the particular information in those specific circumstances would be of the view that harm could be caused to the individual and it would be deemed to be abusive behaviour in accordance with the requirements of Clause 1. They also advised the Committee that Scotland, whose legislation is framed in a similar manner, have not encountered any practical difficulties with the operation of their offence, and if Clause 3 is not part of the Bill, there will be no opportunity to take these type of cases forward. The police also advised that this clause could be used to good effect, but it would be very helpful to have clear examples to ensure from an operational perspective that the organisations involved in progressing cases all have a similar understanding of how this provision should be applied. So the Justice Committee acknowledges the difficulty of legislating in the realm of human relationships. The committee noted that in the evidence provided to it by the two key criminal justice bodies that would be responsible for applying the new law, that being the police service and the public prosecution service, both indicated that they will benefit from the legislation in terms of prosecuting perpetrators for the more subtle forms of controlling behaviour and the ability to better protect victims of domestic abuse and did not raise any con concerns regarding the framing of the offence or clause 3. It is clear that the current law does not adequately recognise that domestic abuse is not limited to physical violence and the committee received compelling evidence of the harmful effects of psychological abuse and the manipulative, subtle and at times covert nature of the behaviour. It can leave victims feeling humiliated, degraded, belittled and, as one individual said, it stripped me of my ability to be me. The committee is of the view that the new offence addresses gaps in the current law 
captures domestic abuse in its myriad forms, will enable more effective action to be taken against perpetrators and will enhance the protection and access to justice provided to victims by the criminal justice system, including those cases where an individual may have suffered considerable abuse over a period of time, but due to the extent and nature of the abuse, the behaviour has become normalised or the person has become resilient to the abuse and does not recognise the harm being caused to them. The Committee therefore supports clauses 1, 2, 3 and 4 of the Bill as drafted. Turning to Clause 9 and the amendments the Minister uh, Rachel Woods and Paul Frew um, have brought forward, the Committee welcomed the aggravator provided by Clause 9, but noted that in the evidence received on this clause, a number of organisations raised concerns regarding whether the wording properly reflected the fact that a child can be aware of and impacted by domestic abuse in the home, even if they do not see or hear the moment in which it occurs, and questioned why the wording differed from that in the Scottish legislation by not including a reasonable person test, and the reference that there does not need to be evidence that a child has ever had any awareness of the behaviour or understanding of the nature of the behaviour for the offence to be aggravated. The Committee spent a considerable amount of time discussing the wording of the clause, and in particular, 9.2 with departmental officials and requested further information regarding whether the aggravator would apply in a situation where a child does not directly witness the abuse and on the department's rationale for adopting a different approach to the wording of this clause from Scotland and not including the reasonable person test. The committee was concerned that the wording of clause 9 was not specific or clear enough and it needed strengthened to reflect that for the offence to be aggravated, there does not need to be evidence that a child had ever had any awareness of or understanding of A's behaviour or been adversely affected to ensure effective enforcement and prosecution. The Committee proposed amending Clause 9 uh, by either adopting the Scottish wording, unless there was any specific reason not to use that wording, or wording that provided the same sort of clarity. The Department responded, advising that the child aggravator applied if, at any time, in the commissioning of the offence, a relevant child sees, hears, or is present during an incident of abuse. They are used to abuse. Uh, they are used to abuse another person, or abusive behaviour is directed at them. The department emphasised that the clause does not provide that the child has to have an awareness of, be adversely affected by, or understand the behaviour, and therefore it considered that an amendment akin to the Scottish legislation was not necessary. The Department also stated that it considered that the child aggravation offence in this Bill is wider than the Scottish offence, in that there is no requirement for a reasonable person to consider that the behaviour would adversely impact on a child or that the child has to live with either the victim or offender. The Committee was not convinced and was still minded to amend the clause. It sought views of the Department on the text of a draft amendment that, in its view, clarified that there was no requirement for the child to have an awareness of, understand the nature of, or ever been adversely affected by A's behaviour, and also asked the Department if it would consider providing greater clarity in relation to these aspects of this clause in the explanatory and financial memorandum that accompanies the Bill. The Department responded, outlining that the Scottish legislation provided that their offence is aggravated if a child sees, hears or is present, plus a reasonable person would consider the behaviour to be likely to adversely affect a child. Proving the aggravation is then subject to a condition that, for the offence to be aggravated, there does not need to be evidence that the child has been aware of, understood or been adversely affected by the abuse. Our offence is aggravated on the basis of an objective fact, simply that the child sees, hears or is present, unlike the Scottish provision which requires this and a consideration of adverse effects. According to the Department, the Committee's proposed amendment would have introduced an unrelated adverse effect provision which was unnecessary and would add nothing to the clause but could risk giving rise to confusion by casting doubt on the effectiveness of it, and on that basis it would not support the amendment. Following further discussion, the Department advised that, given the ongoing concerns of some members, that the wording of Clause 9 did not make it clear that a child need not be aware of, or have understood, or have been adversely affected by abusive behaviour in the context of the provision that the child has seen, heard, or was present when the abusive behaviour occurs, it would consider 
what further clarification could be provided in the explanatory and financial memorandum in relation to Clause 9 2. The Department subsequently confirmed to the Committee that it was proposing to amend the EFM so that in relation to subsection 9 2, it would read, and I quote, that there is no requirement for the child to be aware of or understand the nature of this behaviour or for the behaviour to give rise to some detrimental impact on the child. Any involvement of the child could also be unwittingly or unwillingly. The Department also advised that its understanding of the Scottish provisions and the advice that officials had given to the Committee in writing and during the oral evidence session on 24 September was in fact incorrect. It apologised for the error and clarified the position, but indicated that this did not change its view in relation to the position regarding the Clause 9 uh, sees, hears or is present provision. It again confirmed to the Committee that there is no requirement that the child has been aware of, understood or been adversely affected by the abuse, with the caveat that the Department would amend the explanatory and financial memorandum to ensure there is greater, greater clarity regarding uh, subsection 9.2. The Committee agreed, with the exception of uh, Rachel Woods, that it would support Clause 9 as drafted. Ms Woods indicated that she was still not satisfied with the wording of Clause 9 and intended to bring forward amendments, and these are in front of the House today. So, Mr. Speaker, I have set out at some length the Committee's in-depth consideration of Clause 9, because having questioned on multiple occasions the wording of this clause with the Department, and having received advice and assurances from officials that the wording was sound and adequately covered the issues members were raising, that the text of the proposed Committee amendment would add nothing and could bring, could bring confusion, uh, but to address ongoing concerns of members that they would provide further clarity in the explanatory and financial memorandum to make it clear that the child does not have to be aware of or understand the abuse or to have been adversely affected by it, the Minister then advised the Committee that she intended to bring forward amendments to Clause 9. The Department outlined that the amendments were to ensure the robustness of the provision, make the provision explicitly clear for the avoidance of doubt, and add an additional limb to the clause, meaning that the aggravator would also apply if a reasonable person would consider the course of behaviour or an incident of behaviour which the accused directed at a victim as part of the course of behaviour to be likely to adversely affect the child, and the child usually resides with the accused or the victim or both. I will leave it to the Minister to fully outline her position, given that she has now indicated that she does not intend to move Amendments 5 and 6 following discussion with the Committee uh, last Thursday. And likewise, Rachel Woods and Paul Frew will no doubt outline the aim of the proposed amendments to this clause. I will break briefly speaking as Chairman just to outline on this particular issue of party political position. We had reached an agreed position at the Committee, as I had outlined uh, in my role as Chairman. The Minister's subsequent actions to that uh, in my view, undermined the information and the basis on which that uh, committee position had been reached, and therefore we were left to have to consider that uh, in, the, in the light of the intervention by the Minister through her amendments, uh, because it created then doubt in my mind uh, in respect of uh, the information that we have been provided as a committee on multiple occasions. And on that basis, uh, the DUP will be supporting uh, the amendments in the name of Paul Frew and Rachel Woods. Uh, we would have been voting against the Minister's amendments, but I am noting that she is not going to move those. I will, yes. I thank the member for giving way. Um, in an attempt um, to clarify the situation, what is in the EFM is not part of the Bill. It says at the beginning of the, the explanatory and financial memorandum that it will not form part of the Bill. And therefore, I did not believe when we reconsidered having listened carefully to the Committee's issues, which is part of this process, an iterative process to develop legislation, that it would actually provide the robustness that the Committee were seeking. And on the basis of that, we decided that we would try to bring forward amendments that would give that. I listened again to the Committee last Thursday, and it was very clear that those amendments did not find favour with the Committee, and therefore I do not intend to move those, those amendments today, um, because I am happy to accept amendments 4 and 7. So just to clarify the position, that it was in an attempt to address the issues raised by the Committee, and I have to say gently to the Chairman that it is, it is appropriate that a Minister 
should try to accommodate in as far as does not actually do harm to the intent of the bill, the wishes of the committee to improve it. I appreciate the Minister's intervention. I am not going to dwell on this area because my colleague Paul Frew will, will speak at length in respect of this particular issue. But I gently say to the Minister, uh, whilst it is an irritative process, there was a lengthy consideration stage. There was extensive engagement with the Department. We sought information on multiple occasions. That consideration stage concluded, and subsequent to that, the Minister then provided amendments. I would say, again, because it is relevant to other uh, amendments that were brought forward by the Minister, the process for that direct engagement is at the consideration stage when it is open for the Minister and the Department to reassure members. Um, this is now the consideration stage, and the committee is bringing forward its am amendments to it. But I, I will leave it. I, I will. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to give way to the minister. I appreciate the member's patience on this matter, but the truth of the matter is that when members submit their amendments, that is often it is not clear at the consideration stage whether members intend to submit further amendments. But it is entirely appropriate that a minister, with the backing of the Office of Legislative Council and the additional resources that they have, would look to those amendments and see if they are able to provide a, an amendment which is perhaps more robustly drafted um, in the terms of the bill. That is not unusual. Probing amendments, amendments to test the minister on issues, is not an unusual process. And that this process does not end with consideration stage. There is further consideration stage and third reading. It does move at pace, and I accept that which is why I offered the, the, the chairman an extra week for the committee to consider um, the proposed amendments that I had. He said that was not necessary, but I would not want anyone to leave the chamber today thinking that in any way the committee was bounced on these issues. Again, I thank the minister for the intervention, but again, I gently say to the minister, the department was aware of the committee amendments weeks before we concluded our formal consideration of this weeks before, because the department regularly receives the minutes of those meetings, and it was there. The department chose at that stage uh, not to reveal its hand until a number of weeks later. Now that is a more procedural point. It's a position that the minister uh, has outlined why she has done it. I beg to differ as to whether or not that is the, the right approach to how the committee conducts it, its business, and it is a generic point I make that that is also applicable to a number of the amendments that the Minister brought forward and has subsequently decided not to move. And you're right, we will have further consideration stage, Mr Speaker, whenever some of these aspects will be tidied up. And I welcome the Minister's approach to some of those further amendments that are going to be subsequently brought to it. M moving on, Mr Speaker, to uh, some of the other uh, minor and technical amendments left in Group 1. Uh, amendments 2, 8 and 10, the Department advised the Committee of the Minister's intention to bring these forward and provided the text of them during the Committee stage of the Bill, noting that they are minor drafting changes to tidy up the wording of clauses 8 and 10 to reflect the position that course of behaviour under the main offence is not the sole element of the domestic abuse offence and, and in relation to clause 13 to make sure for the avoidance of doubt that there is no risk of implying that the provisions in the Criminal Law Act of 1967 are ousted by what is contained in this clause. The committee is content to support the amendments. Finally, in my capacity as chairman of the committee, I want to address amendments 16 and 17 of this group, which the minister has brought forward at the request of the committee. Clause 25 provides that the department may issue and may revise guidance in relation to the domestic abuse offence or any other matters as to criminal law and procedure relating to domestic abuse. The committee questioned why the wording of the clause provided that the department may issue rather than must issue guidance and also sought information from officials on when the guidance would be available, whether it, be, whether it, be, whether it would be periodically reviewed and whether the requirement for reviews should be included in the legislation. The guidance on the new domestic abuse fence will set out examples of types of abusive behaviour and provide clarification on a range of areas which will assist the police service and prosecution service uh, from an operational perspective and ensure a common understanding of how the new offence should be applied. The committee considers the provision of the guidance to be a vital component in both the training of the criminal justice agencies and to ensure the consistent and robust implementation of the legislation. 
While the committee acknowledges that it may be common legislative drafting terminology to use the term may issue, and the Department is in the process of developing guidance in conjunction with key stakeholders, the Committee is of the view that there should be no room for doubt regarding the provision of guidance, and therefore Clause 25 should be amended to change may issue to must issue. The Committee welcomes the Minister's agreement to bring forward amendments to provide that the Department must issue guidance on Part 4 of the Bill and such other matters as it considers appropriate. The Committee therefore supports Amendments 16 and 17 and Amendment 19, which will be in Group 3, uh, which provides for the, the guidance to be kept under review and to be revised if necessary. Mr Speaker, that concludes my first contribution to Group 1. Thank you. And I call Linda Dillon. I do not propose to repeat everything that the Chair of the Committee has said, other than to say I concur with, with much of his, his comments, particularly in relation to thanks to those who came before the committee, both organisations and groups and individuals, and particularly again to those individuals who bore witness to their own experiences, which was not easy for them to do, and to be perfectly honest, was not easy to listen to either. It was very difficult because these were people's most very personal experiences and very difficult experiences. And we were tasked with the job of scrutinising legislation that would hopefully address these issues for people in the future. So it was a big responsibility for us as a committee, and I certainly felt the weight of that responsibility as somebody who was dealing with my very first piece of legislation and for it to be such an important piece of legislation. So, I mean, to all of the committee, to the Minister and to the officials and to our committee staff, I want to give an absolute thanks from the bottom of my heart because you were a great help and you certainly helped me to gave my way through this, this piece of legislation, but again to the witnesses, because that's, that's where we get our information. That's where we decide what amendments or what legislation we will support. So I'm going to speak to the first group of amendments, and I, in relation to Amendment 1, Mr Allister's amendment, we are opposing that amendment, and that is based on the committee position in relation to it. I am also um, opposed to the query over clause 3 and Mr Allister's opposition to that, because these clauses go to the very heart of what this bill is about. It is about addressing the gaps. It is about ensuring that where we did not have legislation before to protect those who are most vulnerable in our society, we have. I am not going to go over the statistics that have been borne out and will be borne out, I am sure, later in the debate around the, the numbers of people who suffer domestic abuse and, and the, the numbers of people who report it, and particularly during this time of COVID, because it is not actually about the statistics. It is about every single individual, and not only the individual who is the victim of the abuse, but their children, their families, everybody around them. For every single person that suffers as a result of domestic violence, there are many, many others who will be affected. And that is what this bill is about. It is about trying to embrace that and particularly around the children, and we will speak to that in, in, in later, later amendments. We will also be supporting amendments 2 and 3, as these are only minor amendments to terminology. Amendment 4, we will be supporting, and that is Rachel Wood's um, amendment, and it is a minor change to the wording. And we did query whether it would add anything, but it, it certainly does not detract, and putting it there explicitly on the face of the bill will do no harm, so for that reason we will be supporting that. I want to thank the, the Minister for not moving her amendments 5 and 6 as a result of conversations with the committee on Thursday, because this is a clause, and I mean, some of the other members will speak, I'm sure, more to this. Rachel Woods has brought forward an amendment, and Paul Free put his name to it, so I'm sure they will speak extensively around this issue. But clause 9 was something that was of real concern to us. We really wanted to make sure that we got it right. We wanted to make sure that we got it right because this is about not only the impact at the time of the incident, but the impact for the future of children who not only witness but are impacted without even knowing necessarily that they are impacted. Because if you live in a home where domestic abuse is going on, whether you actually see those acts or not, you will be impacted, you will suffer the harms, there will be adverse effects right into the future. 
And in that, the Chair of the Committee is right. This is cross-departmental, and we won't go into that because the legislation is a, is a justice bill. So I won't go into any real detail on that. But we do need a cross-departmental pr approach to this. We do need every single minister, we need every single member of this assembly to take this issue on as the serious issue that it is. And I think that we have shown in the way that we have addressed this legislation that we do. And even in the fact that the committee have said when this legislation, hopefully, when this legislation is passed, that we will still see this and view this issue as a matter of priority for the committee in the future. So, for that reason, I will, we will be supporting Rachel Woods' amendment to Clause 9, and that's Amendment 7. That the child aggravator and the, uh, and the adverse impact on the child as a result of domestic abuse was something, as I've already said, of particular focus for the committee. And I will speak more to that later on in the bill, particularly around Operation Encompass, which was something that I had raised at the very, I think probably in my very first days in the committee, and had raised over the last couple of years within the policing board, because I seen it as something that was absolutely vital to be addressed, that we needed to address that gap. But I won't, again, I won't speak to that at this point, because it is relevant in, in, in later groupings. The remaining amendments of 8, 10, 16 and 17, we will also be supporting. And that ends my contribution to this grouping. Thank you. And I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, at the outset, I would like to thank the Chair of the Committee for putting together such a comprehensive um, explanation of the Committee to date. And I think it was a very fair synopsis of the work that has gone on to this point. I also think perhaps I won't engage in the thanking at this stage. Maybe I'll leave that for a later time. But I will single out those people who stepped forward and told a personal story. They give a personal account to the committee. And there was nothing more sobering and bringing this bill into reality than listening to the voices of those victims. And I, and I do commend them. And I think it was a very courageous thing to do. And I can certainly put on record it as help for my thinking um, in terms of where we bring this bill forward. Um, on this first grouping, as the SDLP representative on the Justice Committee, I will start to open on the Group 1 listings. And I will start by Amendment 1 that we will be opposing that. And it does propose to leave out the reasonable person test. And I heard Mr Allister's words, and I have a lot of sympathy for much of what he said. However, it isn't as black and white as some of the legislation that he maybe refers to. It is a very complex issue that we're trying to pin down into legislation. And unfortunately, that does challenge minds. And it certainly challenges thinking of what has gone before um, in a legislative process may not fit. And it is a challenge and it's difficult and I appreciate Mr Allister's contribution and I, I certainly have an open ear to finding out um, what the solution is if there is a middle place to be found. Um, due to the strategic and escalating nature of coercive control, it, it's of critical importance that a reasonable test is contained within this legislation. The demeaning gaslighting, persistent behaviours that evolve over time often result in a victim feeling ashamed with low self-esteem and very low self-worth. The stripping of that individual's confidence and self-worth can leave them believing that the behaviours of the perpetrator are in some way justifiable. At the depth of such oppression, it can be deeply, deeply challenging for a victim to see with any real clarity, the extent of the wrong that they are being subjected to. The SDLP supports Clause 3. The clause recognises that it has been determined that a reasonable person has considered the course of behaviour by the perpetrator to be likely to cause B to suffer physical or psychological harm. Furthermore, Clause 2 speaks of the reasonable person's assessment that one or more of the relevant effects of that behaviour is likely to be triggered. The SDLP shares the committee view 
that current legislation does not adequately recognise that domestic abuse is not limited to physical violence and believes that the new offence addresses gaps in legislation, captures domestic abuse in all its myriad forms, will enable more effective action to be taken against perpetrators and will enhance the protection and access to justice provided to those victims by the criminal justice system. In order to achieve this, it is of critical importance that Clause 3 is retained. A number of conditions must be met for the offence to be committed. And importantly, a defence on the grounds of reasonableness offers safeguards throughout this bill. Clause 3 speaks directly to the darkest, less well understood effects of domestic abuse, particularly in its psychological form. The manipulative, coercive behaviours of the perpetrator can deliberately set out to normalise the sinister intention behind their acts. Throughout deliberations, reference has been made to the much publicised Hart case, with brothers Ryan and Luke giving voice to their much loved mother Claire and sister Charlotte, who were, after much abuse, finally murdered by their abusive father and dad. In an interview, Luke Hart said this, and I quote, He created the the conditions to be seen as our saviour, when in fact he was our abuser. Clause 3 reaches that point. It exposes the behaviours of the perpetrators. It removes any tangled web of emotion and shines a light directly on their behaviours and allows it to be judged in the cold light of day. It is Clause 3 in this bill that should keep those abusers awake at night. The SDLP recognises the the points raised by Mr Alistair, but I would put it to him that it is not as black and white as we would perhaps like it to be. On Amendment 2 and 3, um, I do support, and the SDLP will be supporting the Minister, They appear largely technical, and I do acknowledge the Minister's explanation and the Department given to date. Amendment 4, we will also be supporting, because the AFM does state, and I appreciate that the AFM is a guidance to us, but it does state, and it led us to understand, that this could include the accused threatening violence towards a child to control or frighten the partner, connected person, or being abusive towards a child. The amendment proposes to place this on the face of the bill, and the SDLP have heard no reason why that shouldn't happen or any limiting implications it may have. Clause 9 has had a huge level of debate, and rightly so, within the committee stage and on this floor. And I I do appreciate the uh, Chair of the Committee putting on record the very long sequence of events that has moved thinking throughout time on this. And I appreciate that even at this point, the Committee report may not now reflect the views across the Committee for good reason. I think it is important uh, to place on record the letter dated the 5th of November from the Department that was issued to the Clerk of the Justice Committee for the Member's attention. And the content of that letter, however late, has served as a key document in understanding the Department's objectives behind amending uh, amendments relating to the threshold for parental responsibility and aggravation where a child is involved. And I also believe it's uh, important to place on record that the newly evolved departmental position contained in, within the letter significantly does depart from an earlier steadfast position uh, held by the Department, an official position that requires mention because it did strongly influence um, thinking at the committee stage and the final report that was drafted, that was written. Um, This is, however, a legislative process. So, So as debate matures and we develop our thinking on certain concepts and ideas, Uh, we should at least record the pathway that brought us to those final points of agreement. 
The shared objective that we have in this House of developing good law demands that we consider and scrutinise the process of building that legislation as it evolves. To that end, the SDLP recognises the value of the proposal to introduce a reasonableness test within Clause 9. Both Amendments 5 and 7 did make that proposal. However, the second part of Amendment 5, which I understand may not be moved, did depart from that and it did introduce a new notion of residency. Um, and I, and I, I will move on from that because if, if the Minister is not moving on that, I, I expect we will be able to pick up on that at committee and explore the, the reason and rationale behind that. And also I would be eager to know what, if any, impact that would have on Clause 5. So at this stage, we are minded to support Amendment 7, but on the base that it does serve as a base to develop thinking and conversation around the withheld amendments 5 and 6 in case there is added value that we should not overlook. Finally, I would like to put on record also our support for amendment 8 and 10 and acknowledge the Department uh, for listening to the committee and bringing forward 16 and 17, which the SDLP also support. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Again, I call Doug Bailey. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, and I do have to start by thanking the Minister for, for bringing this um, forward. Uh, there's an awful lot of blood, sweat and tears uh, has gone into this bill so far, uh, and there's more to go. Uh, and um, her and her staff have uh, worked extremely hard. And I also have to say thank you as well to uh, the Chair of the, the Justice Committee and, and, the, and the, the Vice Chair of the Justice Committee and my fellow committee members for the level of scrutiny that they have put into uh, the bill so far. It's, it's been exceptional. And, and, and I'll say this. Uh, that I've been an MLA for four and a half years, over four and a half years, and this is the first piece of legislation that I have gone through the scrutiny process on. So it's a real eye-opener to me in, in, in many cases, and you can probably see I've got paper all over the place. Half the time I don't even know how we're doing this, um, but, but I'm, I'm sort of picking it up uh, as we go along. Um, but to address some of the, the, um, the amendments, if I can, I, w I would say one thing, though, and, and it's important for people to understand this. Of course, there's going to be um, some disagreements between the, the, the minister and, and the chair or, or, or the, the committee uh, and DOJ, but those frictions are healthy. Those frictions are what makes it work. Um, so I, I think that, that that's what we have to understand. Allow them frictions, and we deal with them uh, as and when uh, they come up. But if I look at the the amendments, uh, if I can, um, please. First of all, um, I, I can't support um, Amendment uh, 1. Uh, and I can't support Amendment 1 for, 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 for simple reasons. Because I read it, Amendment 1, uh, and I look at this in primary colours. Um, and that, some people say, is a simplistic way to do it, but that's the way I do business. And I look at this in simplistic colours. And that a reasonable person would consider a course of behaviour to be likely to cause B harm. That is absolutely reasonable. And you can look at various different reasons why that is reasonable, because what we're trying to do is look at every single possible scenario that that might want to affect, such as the person who may have mental health issues, who don't know they're being abused, who don't see that course of behaviour that's affecting them, but others do see it, and they must then be able to intervene. That's reasonable. That is absolutely reasonable, and therefore, I, I, you know, where I can understand the points that are being made, um, I, I can't support that. Um, in regards to um, clause three, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've got some sympathy um, uh, with Mr. Allister in, in clause three, and I think that, that, that there, there may be something to look at in regards to the wording of this as well. But I, I think in all of this, what we're really trying to do is pre be proactive in regards to um, domestic ab abuse. Um, but certainly in the, the consideration stage, the further consideration stage, I, I think there's something to, to look into that and don't dis disregard it as, uh, as just somebody else's a, a opinion and we're not going to use it. I think actually there's some, there's some really valid points that Mr Alistair brought out uh, in regards to um, Clause 3. Uh, and I certainly will be raising them at the committee um, just so that we tie it down and we've got this absolutely right. Because what I don't want is that the last hurdle, after all of the good work that we've done, is that we end up just getting it wrong. 
So we, we, I think we will look at this and make sure we understand it. Um, of course, the Ulster also Unionist Party will be supporting Amendment 2 and Amendment 3 uh, and Amendment 4. I don't want to dwell on them. Um, we've got an awful lot of work um, to go through. Um, and, and the Ulster Unionist Party will be supporting uh, Amendment 7. Uh, and the reason that I think we would be supporting, uh, supporting Amendment 7, and this appears, I guess, throughout the whole of the bill, uh, is an issue that I raised um, at the committee stage. And that was the issue about parental alienisation and how children are used to abuse other people. Um, and although it does not appear in the face of the bill, and I did ask for it to appear in the face of the bill, um, and we had long discussions about it appearing in the face of the bill, it, it doesn't do. But what department, departmental lawyers have made clear is, is that the various different clauses, including this Clause 9, would make sure that parental alienation would be something that would result um, uh, in, in a charge of domestic abuse. And parental alienation happens to so many people within our society. And parental alienation is not just about denying one parent access to a child. It's about denying a parent access to key milestones of that child, denying a parent access to school reports in regards to that um, child, uh, just using that child as a weapon. Um, and I guess when I look at um, clause 9, um, and I see that as it is now unamended, it, it does that in part. But the amendment that's been brought forward by um, Rachel Woods and Paul Frew really does, in my mind, nail that down for me uh, and, and makes it happier for me. And, and this is scattered throughout the bill, I have to say. It's not just in Clause 9. But for me, it, it, it absolutely ties it down. Uh, and that's why um, I will be supporting um, Amendment 7, and the party will be supporting Amendment 7, Clause 9. Um, uh, yes, of course, sorry. For taking an intervention. Would the member agree with me that the issue in Clause 9, um, as was outlined by um, Sinead Bradley, is around or can be highlighted by the Hart case? And, and we'll probably all use the Hart case as an example because they are one of the very few who survived to tell the tale. Because very often in those cases where there is murder suicide, the entire family is killed in these, in these situations. And that is because the very ultimate end of these coercive control situations can very often be the death of those who have been coercively controlled. Uh, and you are absolutely right, and, and, and thank you for that. And I think we can't shout loud enough about that. We can't stop saying that, um, uh, because that is the worst possible case from this. Um, but when I look at it, you know, it says a made use of child and directing behaviour against B. Uh, and that can, that, can, that can come in any form, um, and we must be mindful for that. And that's why I say that um, where I was happy with, with Clause 9, amendment to Clause 9 actually ties it down an awful lot more. So that's why uh, I, I support Amendment 7 in regards to this. Uh, and of course, uh, I will be supporting uh, Amendment 8 and 9 uh, and 10 also. Um, Mr. Speaker, it, it, is, it is complicated. It is a complicated um, bill. Uh, there's a lot in it. You can read it one way and you can really twist your mind in a certain direction only for it to be flipped back again when somebody brings in another scenario. What we're trying to do here is, is cast the net as wide as we possibly can in order to catch all the scenarios um, that are available. Uh, and therefore, what I would say is that some of the amendments by the Justice Minister and certainly the amendments by the Justice Committee are doing exactly that, and that is trying to capture all of those things. Um, and that's why I've been so impressed by the work uh, of the Justice Committee uh, over this last number uh, of months, and I'll certainly be supporting all of the amendments that have been put forward by the Justice Committee. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Paula Bradshaw. Speaker, um, I rise to oppose Amendment 1 and the opposition to Clause 3, but to support all the remaining amendments in this group. I very much appreciate the opportunity to respond on behalf of the Alliance Party at this consideration stage of such a much-needed and long-awaited piece of legislation. Before I comment on the amendments for us in this group, I would like to place on record my thanks to the Justice Minister and her departmental officials, the members of the Justice Committee and the many stakeholder groups, charities and individuals for the tremendous amount of work that has gone into getting the, this bill to this point. 
The campaign by organisations such as Women's Aid, Men's Advisory Project, Nexus, to name but a few, for a robust legislative framework through which the courts, PSNI, Public Prosecution Service and social workers could operate has been long, and I hope that this Assembly can deliver a law that addresses gaps in provision and ultimately protects sorry, ultimately provides appropriate protections and remedies for the victims of domestic abuse. Before I address the amendments, because this is the first time I've spoken um, about this um, bill during its passage, I would like to place on record some of my personal thoughts in, in relation to parental alienation and address some of the concerns that some people have of aspects of the bill, that it could be used to further um, the abuse of victims, and then there are others who do not, do not feel that the provisions in the bill go far enough in stipulating an offence. So I am stating these in a personal um, opinion of this misunderstood term. This is about when someone, a man or a woman, has the strength or opportunity, because it is not always just about strength, to leave an abusive relationship. They leave behind the coercive control, they regain financial autonomy, they are able to reconnect with family and friends, maybe get back to work, and they are able to build their life away from the perpetrator. In many instances, the only link they retain with their ex-partner is their child or children. Their abuser can no longer control them, and their abusive behaviour is no longer a factor in their lives. However, when there is still contact between both parents, they do have the ability to perpetrate the abuse through the one thing that they know will have the most emotional impact, and that is the abuse of their child. In this way, this abuse can continue. Furthermore, while weaponising, and I think um, the previous speaker, Doug, used the word to weaponise the child, um, they, they are they're using the fact, sorry, Furthermore, while weaponising the, ch the child or children and using them to punish the victim for leaving them, they are also abusing the child. The innocent child or children are caught in the middle, left confused and conflicted. That is why they have to be factored into this bill, and it, indeed it is why some of the amendments have strengthened that aspect of the bill. We are all aware of ACES, adverse childhood experiences, and the impact that trauma in childhood can have. It can lead to negative long, uh, lifelong emotional and poor physical outcomes. And I think um, um, Linda Dillon touched upon that as well, that this is not just about justice, this is a cross-departmental issue. The list of ACEs includes domestic violence and being a victim of physical or mental abuse. So even from a public health prism, we must, in my opinion, ensure that this legislation provides safeguards as much as possible to stop children's experiences of parents' abusive behaviour no matter to whom it is directed, of having a lifelong impact on them. So turning to the amendments, Mr Speaker. Um, uh, amendment 3 to Clause 9, aggravation where a relevant child is present. This is a minor but significant change, as it will ensure that aggravation can be applied, to, applied if any or all aspects, sections of the clause are present. And similar reasons... We are also um, happy, I'm sorry, for similar reasons, we are also happy at this stage to accept the enhancements to Clause 9 and Amendments 4 and Amendment 7. This bill is in some ways substantially different from that in Scotland, the Domestic Abuse Protection Bill, but the basis for, of determining how a reasonable person might consider the behaviour is fundamental and important to both, and I think we can all agree that this needs to be explicit in this legislation. With regards to Amendment 1 and also the notice of opposed opposition to Clause 3, this is something which would fundamentally alter the offence and therefore the point of the Bill. The judgment, as in Scotland and elsewhere, must be that a reasonable person would consider harm to have been caused. That is the whole point of the legislation, as it refers not just to physical but also vitally to psychological harm. Not to grasp that is not to grasp the fundamental point of um, domestic abuse and coercive control, importantly. Let this House be clear. When people normalise controlling behaviour, just because it is ongoing does not mean no controlling behaviour has taken or is taking place. To be clear also, where a court is presented with a case where there is no intent, no harm and none of the effects of abusive behaviour, it is simply not going to arrive at that position that someone should be prosecuted and jailed for 14 years, as Mr Alistair was alluding to. 
Those suggesting this are trying to remove the idea that controlling and coercive behaviour should be a crime. They are also trying to remove the idea that a child can be harmed without being immediately aware of the harmful impact. Sadly, again, it is a basic principle of ch child protection, for example, that the impact may come and be acutely felt years later in life. The requirement in the legislation um, is that a reasonable person would consider harm to have been caused and that, has, that it has been called, carried out intentionally or recklessly. We should remember also, as some choose to forget, that the legislation also contains a reasonable defence provision if the behaviour is reasonable in certain circumstances, for example, somebody's safety. In conclusion, Mr Speaker, Amendments 16 and 17 are useful to add clarity, the former as requested by the committee. I am content that these add to the Department's ability to ensure this legislation is used to its fairest and best effect. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Paul Frew. Speaker, and uh, I rise having to welcome this bill at this stage. It's been a long road. Um, before I get into the depth of the bill and the actual amendments, uh, there are people who, needs, who need to be acknowledged here today. Uh, as, the deputy, as the chairperson has already alluded to, the committee staff. Uh, now, MLAs can populate a committee. Uh, we can do as much hard work as we can in the hours that we're given. But when we leave the committee, it's the staff that continue that work until we again hit that room and that committee function. So uh, my deepest thanks to the clerk and the team in the committee, who I've known for a considerable length of time now, and I must say are top of their game. Absolutely no doubt about it, top of their game. And what they have helped MLAs here produce is second to none with regards to the report and the detail within it, and have helped and facilitated us as MLAs to scrutinise bill, this bill as best we can. And that's vitally important. Uh, without that support, we can't do our job properly, and then we can't provide legislation that's fit for purpose. We don't stand a chance. Another thanks has to go to, and it's already been alluded to today, the many victims and the many people who have been impacted by domestic abuse, domestic violence and coercive control. This is a horrendous activity. And for the first time, first time in our history, this will now be an offence. And that is really, really important. And this, this assembly should shine a light of hope out to those victims, out of those people who suffer, not only the people who suffer, but their families who can watch this sometimes in slow motion, who feel they can't do anything about it, can't help, can't assist, can't change the course of events that take place. That's horrendously hard for anyone to watch, even if it's indirectly. Even neighbours, even neighbours who watch this on a daily basis can't affect change. Now, maybe now they will. Acknowledgement must also go to the former Justice Minister, Claire Sugden. When Claire first took office, she made this her number one priority. When I first took office as the Justice Committee chairperson, I too made this my number one priority, along with stalking. And very quickly, the former minister and myself came to an arrangement that she would push forward with the domestic violence bill. The committee would work on a stalking report, which then we could hand to the minister whenever she had developed her domestic violence or domestic abuse bill, and then she could pick up our report and run with it and produce a piece of stalking legislation too. So I commend and I thank the former minister, uh, Claire Sugden, for her priorities for her activities and for her work in this regard because it was right and it was needed. So I thank her for that. And I, I can't let it go today. I cannot let it go today that I stand here with a sense of regret because this bill should have been passed three years ago. 
This bill should already be in statute. We should already be seeing reports coming out to tell us how effective this law is, to see what the crime statistics are, so that we maybe need to apply a second bill to ensure that this legislation is fit for purpose. And we've been deprived of that up to now. And so has the victims. And that's unforgivable. Three years? Unforgivable, Mr Speaker. So it's with a sense of regret also that I stand here today. Because those three years, you think of the suffering. Think of the suffering that people had to go through while this place didn't meet. Just think about it. This is only one aspect of law. This is only one bill. This is only one subject. You think about those people sitting in their homes, really suffering, while this place wasn't meeting. It is unforgivable. It really is. But we're here now. So what do we have to do now? We have to make sure that this law is the best law that can be. And I must admit, I've struggled with this bill. I've struggled with this bill because of the way it's written, the way it's compiled. Whilst I have sympathy for the department, there was so much I wanted to do, so many amendments I wanted to add, and most people will know me now. Uh, I wouldn't shy away from that. I would try and test things, and I would try and form things and persuade people into my way of thinking. Uh, and I wanted to try and attach stalking to this bill, but that was ruled out very quickly. When you read, when you read very clearly Clause 1, where, where A and B are personally connected to each other at the time, and I guess I know why this is in here, and that's the reason why I couldn't attach the stalking piece, even one clause. I wanted just one clause to give those victims some sucker, to give them some sort of hope in the future. But of course, we have this stalking legislation coming forward. It's promised. It's nearly at the door of this assembly, and I can't wait till I see that legislation also. Uh, I also wanted to do something on strangulation. And I still reserve the right to do something on strangulation at the next stage. And the reason why it's important to talk about it is to engage people's minds on this. Strangulation, I believe, is one of the most horrendous crimes in domestic violence. It's not, it's not coercive control, but I'll talk about that later. Strangulation, I think. Yes, I, yep, go on. I thank the member for giving way, and I mean I share his concerns, particularly um, about non-fatal strangulation, because I think that there is a mounting body of evidence um, that it is a precursor um, to domestic homicide. And I know that um, Judge Barney McElhone, um has said very clearly that he is very concerned um, about strangulation because often it can be very difficult after the event to detect whether someone has been subject to strangulation because it doesn't necessarily leave marks or, or any uh, signs of abuse. For that reason, um, as you'll be aware, um, obviously um, as a member of the committee, the department is taking forward work around strangulation in terms of trying to build policy and um, development around this and in order to try to find the best way to put this into a legislative um, mechanism. But it is important that that policy development work um, and the consideration of that and the consultation on that um, is able to proceed in order to build the body of evidence. But I do absolutely um, acknowledge and share the concerns. I thank the member for that intervention and for putting that on the record because that is very, very helpful. Uh, and I, I, await, I await how that plays out uh, in, in the coming days, weeks and, and months. Another issue, Mr Speaker, is, is the rough sex uh, defence. And I looked at doing something around that. Um, but the department uh, officials were concerned, so we were concerned, that to add in defence like this on specific matters could actually hurt the bill because of the way the bill is formed. Uh, so I take that. But again, I reserve the right on that too. Uh, and we'll keep people on their toes. Yes, yes, I will. Yep. I thank the member um, for giving way. Um, great minds think alike, and we'll just stop it there. But um, I'm also concerned about the idea 
um, around rough sex defence, and it's something that has been raised with me um, by a number of members. There is now um, consultation um, on that particular issue, and it is something that we are hopeful can be dealt with in the miscellaneous provisions bill. It would be at amendment stage because it has come onto the radar um, later than some of the other measures which we would hope to incorporate in the original bill, but it would be my intention to try to develop the drafting as quickly as possible so that it can be considered by the committee during the normal um, committee consideration stage and that we can incorporate that if required into legislation. Can I just ask people to kind of try to stick within the scope of the, this particular debate? These issues are very, very important, obviously, and the ma member very creatively has put them on the record. But please return to the, the, uh, the amendments in front well, of us. Mr. Speaker, and I will take your ruling on that. And I thank the minister for placing that on the record, also, because that again is very, very useful and very commendable. So I thank you, Minister, and I thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, 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 I take the ruling that you've given, and I will try and resist any further. Uh, distortion of this debate and this bill. Um, so here we, have, here we have this bill in front of us, and we're talking about the, the formation of the offence. My experience on this issue goes back to my days um, uh, when I was in the Justice Committee at first. And when I had met with groups of barristers and judges around these issues, it was very clear and even solicitors and, and everyone else involved in the legal world, it was very clear that everyone was grappling with how we could deal with coercive control. And I think that's played out today also with Mr. Alistair's interventions and, and moving this debate. And I can understand that. I, I, I get his arguments 100%. But what, what we are trying to do here is something completely different. And whilst we need to ensure and satisfy ourselves that this is the best legislation possible and that there can be no unintended, unintended negative consequences, I think that Clause 1, 2, 3 and 4 speaks of coercive control in a way that has never been legislated for before. And, and, and Mr. Alistair talks about other offences and other laws and legislations that can and could have been used. But I simply say to him at this point, it hasn't been used. That legislation hasn't been used. There are so many victims and alleged victims, before he tells me off, that, that, that suffer this on a daily basis, a weekly basis, a yearly basis who have never, ever received justice. The perpetrators and the alleged perpetrators have never, ever received justice. And that's why we have been moved in this House, by the, and the Minister and the former Minister, to, to move on a Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, because it's required. So then, if, if you get to the point where you know it's required, then you have to piece it together. And when you piece it together, I would struggle to find how you could leave out Clause 1, 2, 3, and 4. Because it tries, and this is, a, this is a mystery to me yet, and maybe the Minister maybe will allude to this in our, our, opening, our remarks. We have a bill here that's entitled Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. But what we really want to create an offence about is coercive control. But not once, not once in this bill is it mentioned. Not once. In this bill is parental alienation mentioned, but yet we're told that it's covered. So I read the clauses and I can see where that is the case. And I can see where they've captured what I believe to be coercive control. And I say, yes, yes, I, I see that, I see that. You don't necessarily have to mention it to actually encapsulate it and capture it. Uh, so so I, 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 guess, I guess that has satisfied me in that regard. But I would fear to take away and to remove any of those first four clauses would diminish that strength, would remove the co coercive controlling nature that we're trying to capture with domestic abuse. And I, I suppose then that brings me on to my point about, about uh, harm. Because what we know is this, and it's human nature, we tend to move away from harm. We tend to move away from harm wherever we can. 
Now, if it's a, a hot ring on a, in a kitchen, we try and remove ourselves from that. It means we don't leave the kitchen. It means we just stand clear of the hot ring. But it has an effect. It has an impact. And you will function differently around that hot hob, and you will do something different. You will beware. You will change tack. You will change direction. That's a bit like harm in this sense where you will modify your position, your daily habits, and you'll be conditioned because of that harm. And it's not just the harm that can be inflicted. It is the threat of the harm. And there's times when people can threaten you with the most horrendous thought that you can ever have in your head. And you will comply. You don't need to be told twice. You will comply. And what coercive control is to me is the little digs, the little things, the behavior, the manipulative behavior that makes you change your course because you're reasonable, because you want to make peace, because you don't want to create a fuss because you don't want your child to experience anything robust or even horrendous. And that's at the start. But then it becomes much more than that. And it can come, and there's a full spectrum here, a full range. But imagine when you are threatened by the perpetrator, threatened that you won't be raped but a child will be raped. Your own child, your niece, your best friend's child, your next door neighbor's child. You're threatened with that. That hasn't caused you harm. That hasn't caused you harm. But you will comply because you know that that perpetrator is deadly serious. That's a coercive control at the very end of the spectrum. But it happens. It happens. And we need to capture it in this legislation. There's absolutely no doubt about that. When you're a victim of coercive control, you do not know whether you're up or down. You do not know what day it is. You do not know what's normal practice. You become conditioned. You become immune you become immune to the very abuse that you are suffering on a daily basis, and you live with it. You live with it. That's why we need these clauses. That's why we need the reasonable person. That's why we need to capture this. Your life is in despair. And your life is not your own. Because by that point, you're trying to protect yourself as best you can, but more so, you're probably trying to protect your, someone else you love. You experience out-of-body experiences when you feel you don't even own your own body. That puts another layer onto it. Every single one of us in this chamber will go home for a rest we'll go home for a rest. We might be here late. I suspect we will. But we will go home for a rest. You can't rest if you live in a household where you are a victim of domestic abuse and coercive control. You move away from harm. You'll do what you have to do to move away from harm. And that's why we must capture, that's why we must capture this legislation, the way it's, re the way it's written. And that's why I support the first four clauses of this bill. I hope I've illustrated to the House the reason why we can't support Amendment 1 and the removal of Clause 3. Um, and that brings me on then to uh, Amendment 3. Amendment 3, I see it as being just a tidying up exercise, and I get that. Uh, I don't know why it's needed, because the way, the, the way that... Uh, Clause 9 was written. 
Uh, I thought it was strong enough with regards to the ORs, uh, but again, uh, it doesn't do any harm, so I support, I support that, absolutely. There's no issue there. Uh, and then I get to the, the clause, other Clause 9 amendments. And the chairperson has outlined quite well the procedure that we went through and the horrendous task, uh, this forensic detail that we went into on Clause 9. And can I, Mr. Speaker, at this stage, commend the work of the committee? This place here can be quite a bear pit. Uh, I'm still getting used to that robust language, I'm still honing my skills. But in the committee, that's where the work is done. And if we should be proud of something in our job, it's the work of the committee and of the committee. Because not only do we scrutinise ministers and, make and hold them to account, and let's face it, with no uh, opposition, so that's, that is the opposition, but we work together. We work together as a team on our committees. And there's something badly wrong if committees don't work as a team. They're not functioning right. So when a committee works, and as a team, it works as a dream. It works very well to help scrutinise and produce legislation. And I thank every single one of the members of the committee for the work that they have done on this bill. And credit where credit is due, because Rachel Woods persevered, asked questions, persevered further with a determined figure to keep going to push and press the officials till we get to this point here today. And I support 100% for it and I applaud her. But she and I pushed this and pushed this and there was times we didn't think the officials got it and we tried to formulate a, an amendment and we were helped with the bill office. And we produced, the committee produced an amendment and the department said no, you're adding confusion to the bill. It's not required. Well, we seen straight away, we saw straight away that it was required. Uh, there was a hole here in Clause 9. There was a real hole. For the purpose of subsection 1, the domestic abuse offence is aggravated by reason of involving a relevant child if, at any time in the commission of the offence, a directed behaviour at the child or a made use of the child in directing behaviour at B. And then 2B states the child saw or heard or was present during an incident of behaviour which A directed at B as part of the course of the behaviour. Now, when you read, now of course, I'll go into this in a wee minute, but when you read the EFM then, that helps you get an understanding of the clauses, and that's why this is essential at this stage. But when you read the clause 9, and I do believe there's a hole there, and you read Clause 9, EFM, it helps shed some light on it, but it just confirms that there's a hole there. And a direct behaviour at the child, and I read the EFM, provides that the aggravation applies where it is shown that at any time in the commissioning of the offence, the accused directed behaviour at a child. This could include the accused threatening violence towards a child to control or frighten the partner-connected person or being abusive towards the child. That's fair enough. That's important. But then, part two, 9.2.2, two, two, the made use of the child in directing behaviour at B. Now, when you read that, it states in the EFM, provides that the aggravation applies where it is shown that in committing the offence, the accused made use of the child in directing behaviour at their partner-connected person. This could apply where the accused encourages or directs a child to spy on or report on the day-to-day -day activities of a partner or connected person. The involvement of the child could be unwittingly or unwillingly. I always struggle with that word. So that confirms to me, and it confirmed to me, and it confirmed to Rachel, that there was a hole in this clause. Again, we thrashed this out, committee, week in, week out, and we talked about the EFM, and the, the officials said, well, look, if we, if we add unwittingly and unwillingly to the whole clause, would that help? And yes, that would help. And I would have been satisfied with that, I think. 
I don't know, because if Rachel had put down her clause, I probably would have signed it anyway. Uh, but I was content at that point. So then we get, and, and of course, remember our, men, our, our amendment in the committee was we were told by the officials that it would add confusion to the bill. But then what happened was the minister then moved her own amendments in clause 9. And that did nothing but add confusion to the bill. It really did add confusion to the bill. And I believe it damaged clause 9. And I'm glad, and I thank the minister for not moving it today. But I think we have to still address it. And we have to talk to it. Because I wouldn't want anybody getting any other ideas at further consideration stage. What the minister did in Amendment 5 is she added the words suffer fear, alarm, and distress. When you can quite clearly see throughout this bill that it's not being descriptive, but yet we're adding it here to the, to the aggravator, the child aggravator. And also part two of that, the child usually resides with A or B. No, no, at no time did myself or Rachel, or Rachel Woods or anybody else in that committee state that that was a requirement. In fact, it isn't a requirement. We don't need it. We don't want it. We never, ever did. Why? Because that excludes so many people who could be in danger. You have the perpetrator threatening the victim, the alleged victim. You then, you then have the coercive control of nature, and you have, you have a family member coming around to check on you. To check, make sure you're okay. Maybe they know there's something going on. Maybe they suspect something is going on. But they're going to be there to check on you. And they're going to try and protect you. And then the perpetrator sets his sights on that person. Not you, the victim. But on your loved one. And that loved one who's came to check on you. Who's got enough knowledge and experience to know there's something going awry. Something going wrong. But they then have a child. So that perpetrator will will threaten your niece or nephew and you will comply. Maybe it's a best friend. Maybe it's a best friend who checks up on you and they have a daughter or a son and that perpetrator uh, uh, threatens violence on them. You will comply. Your next door neighbour knocks on the door. Are you okay, love? Are you okay, sir? We heard about a banging last night. We're not sure what's going on. Are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. Nothing to worry about. The victim closes the door. The perpetrator looks at that victim and says, do not tell her anything. Do not tell him anything. If you run to your neighbor, you see what happens to their son or their daughter. You will comply. You will not say a word to your neighbour. That's what it is that we're trying to legislate for. That is what, and, and that's why, that is why when we seen this Minister's Amendment coming in, we were horrified. We really were. We were horrified because of all the dialogue, all the work we'd done, all the examples we tried to give, all the time we held the committee up, and yet we had this, and we couldn't believe it. And I'm glad that the minister has moved, uh, uh, has, has prayed not to move. And I thank her for that. But why, what is the whole? Why do we need, why do we need the reasonable person's uh, uh, clause? And again, I commend Rachel for perseverance and for determination and for putting this down. And it's quite simply that the child shouldn't need to be aware all of those scenarios that I've painted for this house, the child will never be aware that they have been threatened and that their life is in danger. Their life is really in danger. That child will never know. That child will never know that they have been threatened or that they are in danger. And that is why we need to fill the gap. That is why we need this clause. Now, I know Rachel will speak in this at length. It's her amendment. It's her amendment. I've simply put my name to it because I support Rachel 
upwards, and I argued with her in the committee right through each meeting, day in, day out. And it's, it's, it, it, it just adds that dimension that I've described. I don't know that I need to go on any further because Rachel will talk to it. But why, why is Clause 9 in its entirety so important? I, I received a, an email from Bernardo's and, and NSPCC, and they've all, they'll all be listening in, Women's Aid and, and all, all of those uh, groups that help people and victims in this. They'll all be listening in. But just to encapsulate why Clause 9 is so important, we know from our service delivery experience that children are adversely impacted by domestic abuse. Even if they do not see or hear it or are not present at the time of the offence. For example, they may see their parents' injuries. They might even feel their distress or be impacted by the environment of fear. They may experience high levels of anxiety and instability social isolation, or experience poor caregiving because of a lack of parental resources or capacity. Living in a home where domestic abuse takes place can have a profound impact on a child's short and long-term physical, mental, and emotional well-being, as well as their behaviour. The long-term impacts on children included a detrimental impact on their mental health, their development, risk of harmful sexual behaviour, future cycles of abuse, and the potential of youth offending. That can't be understated. Through no fault of the child, that child could be repelled into a world that is alien to them, but nonetheless they will live through. And it will, re it will raise that child to even offend themselves. It might, it might be other crime. It might be a frustration. It might be a cry for help. It might be all of those things. But if the victim can be normalized and immune to the, to the violence and the abuse in the course of control, and can be conditioned by the coercive control. So can the child. So can the child. To the point where the child thinks that behaviour is normal. So when that child grows up, starts forming relationships, that child could then become an offender of domestic abuse. Yes, yes, I will. Would the member agree with me that that child can also become a victim? Because when you see something and that becomes normalised, you think, if it was good enough for my mummy, if it was good enough for my daddy, then it's good enough for me. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that is, the, that is the, the nature of coercion control. It goes right into your very soul. This crime goes right into your very soul. And that's why... That's why the legal system, the judicial system, and every art and part of that system could well struggle, could well struggle with this. And that's one of the reasons why we need the independent supervision and that we need the reporting, which we'll talk about later. And that's why, that's the safeguards, I believe, that we have to play with. And that's why I believe the committee strengthens this bill, very much so. And we'll talk about that later. But it goes right, this, this crime, this offence goes right to the soul of a person. And it will change that person, change everything about that person. Change their body, their form, their mindset. It will condition, it will coerce, and they will become a victim. And they won't, sometimes they won't even know it. Because that's normal. That's what they have to live with. They get on with it. And they become immune. That's no way to live. There are so many people out there today living like this. That needs to change.
We need to give them the support. There are so many people out there supporting these people. And they fight as if they have one hand behind their back. This law, this bill, will go some way to releasing that second hand so they can put up a fight and they can defend the people who need defending, the victims of domestic violence and coercive control. The other amendments in this section, Mr. Speaker, again, the, I support the, the change in age that the Minister is providing from 18 to 16 in this. Uh, and again, the other, the other clauses, the other amendments that, that the Minister is bringing, changing the may to must, that's something that the committee had asked for, and I thank the Minister for that. Uh, it just makes that wee bit stronger, and it's tidying up language, but it's very critical to us, and it's very, very important. We're here now. We're, we're here now debating this consideration stage, and the message has to go out to those victims that we hear you. We know what you're going through, and we're trying to fix it. You have an ear in this assembly, and we're going to listen to you, and we're going to pass this legislation. And you know what? We're going to report in this legislation. And you know what? We're going to come back to it when we can. And we're going to strengthen it if we have to. And we have to make it better, we will, to safeguard you. We're here now. And we say to the perpetrator, you must stop. You must stop this behaviour. In some cases, you might not even know you're doing it. You might be as conditioned as the victim you're creating. But it ends. It has to end. We can't abide by it anymore. We've failed our people too long. We need to get this passed as soon as possible. And we need to get, need to get it into play. We need to get all the arts and parts of the judicial system trained up to cope with this legislation, cutting edge as it is, and we have to get to a point where we start to protect the victims of domestic abuse, domestic violence, and coercive control. So I support this bill 100%. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I call Emma Rogan. This is a significant day for me as an MLA to be able to debate this, my first piece of legislation on the floor of this House as well. Legislation that I have been scrutinising along with my Sinn Féin colleagues and my colleagues on the Justice Committee. This legislation will make a real difference to many lives across the North. I would like, like, like so many of my colleagues on the Justice Committee, to thank those that gave such powerful testimony that at times was harrowing and heartbreaking to listen to. But they did it, and they did it with great dignity and great gusto, knowing that the small glimpse that they would give us of what they had to suffer would shape this bill. The new domestic abuse offence in this bill is what makes this legislation such a transformative bill, and one that will make tangible differences to the lives of so many. Clause 1 to 4 of this bill are a radical departure from an existing legislation which has failed victims for so long. We all know that domestic abuse is not just physical violence, that it often includes psychological abuse, threatening behaviour, financial abuse. We know that domestic abuse can involve isolating victims from their friends, from their families and other sources of social interaction, depriving victims of their freedoms and controlling the victim's day-to-day -day activities. Humiliating, degrading and intimidation are am among many others. It is hugely damaging and repulsive behaviour, and I, so I am thankful that this legislation will now recognise it for what it is. The charity Hourglass deal with the abuse of elder people, older people. They warn that over 20,000 elderly people are abused per year. Most of the abuse reported was psychological, including threats, intimidation and mockery. When questioned, they, they had experienced this, suggesting 20,000 people in the north are affected. Our glass also warned of significant increase in abuse and neglect of elderly across the north due to lockdown and self-isolation during this pandemic that we're in. We need to support the vol voluntary and community organisations that have mobilised during the COVID crisis to assist to protect the vulnerable. I therefore greatly welcome Clause 5 of the Bill, which defines broadly the types of relationships for which this new domestic abuse offence would apply.
While many view domestic abuse through the outdated and quite uninformed lens of intimate relationships, Clause 5 ensures that other relationships, including children, parents, grandparents or siblings, are included. This is an important clause which ensures the protections are provided in for this bill. While some organisations raised questions around this, during the committee stage of the bill, it was established that this clause is, clause is necessary in cases where an individual may have suffered considerable abuse over a period of time. But due to the extent and the nature of this, that it has become normalised and or a result this person is unaware of what they have, or that they have been abused. Like Sinead Bradley referenced earlier, the Hart case was one of the most stark Luke Hart said his father spent most of his time belittling his family. He would use money as a way to control him, to stop his wife going for a coffee, call his daughter stupid, said his sons were not real men. Then, after years of abuse, he killed them with a sawn-off shotgun. Luke, when speaking to BBC last year, said the violence seemed to come out of nowhere. But control had always been growing, and murder is the ultimate act of control. It was the next step on his journey. The domestic homicide review in that case stated that they had been suffering intense domestic abuse for many years and didn't know it, but there was no physical abuse. This is a heartbreaking case, but as we know, this type of coercive control and abusive behaviour happens every day across the country, and there are many victims like Claire and Charlotte Hart who are stuck in abusive relationships and need our protection. This legislation will create laws that will provide protection from all types of domestic abuse, from sibling to sibling to parents and grandparents. This bill also seeks to include additional protections for children. Children are the hidden victims of domestic abuse. Children who suffer adverse childhood experiences. Research has shown that these will have long-term impacts on children's mental, emotional and physical well-being. Clause 8 provides for an aggravation of the domestic abuse offence where the victim is in the relationship is under the age of 18. And Clause 9 provides for an aggravation where a child is involved. I want to note that the importance of these clauses, as we know, whilst a lot of time, lots of time the domestic abuse may be targeted at a partner in an intimate relationship, children often carry a huge burden from the abuse and they themselves are a victim. Such abuse can leave a long-lasting impact on a child, and it is only right that this impact is recognised in the law by this aggravation. I also welcome the fact that this clause provides that a child only has to see, hear or be present during the abuse to constitute the aggravation, and that the Amendment 7 will provide that the child does not have to have any awareness or understanding of the perpetrator's behaviour. These clauses will go some distance to protect children of the horrors of this abuse. Carol Haggett, thank you. And I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I won't be very long with this because I appreciate that it's, it's a very long debate and there have been fantastic contributions so far. Um, there's been a lot of thanks happened this evening um, and I would like to thank um, the Justice Minister, the previous Justice Minister, the Chair of the Justice Committee and the Justice Committee members and of course all the staff that have been involved so far with getting this bill this far. Um, I rise, as my previous or my colleague Paula Bradshaw had done earlier, to support um, most of the amendments that are put forward. Unfortunately, I can't support Amendment 1 and the opposition to Clause 3, and I'll explain why. Um, I'm not on the Justice Committee, but I am a constituency MLA. And just to give a bit of an idea and a personal connection, and I know that the committee has been talking to a number of people and we'll, we'll realise the emotion that you can have when you're dealing with victims of domestic abuse. But I was very recently dealing with a casework case where the victim um, was a woman whose mother had been the victim of domestic abuse. And this was a, an adult woman who was at her wit's end. And when we talk about harm and that harm isn't defined in criminal law, all I can say is I witnessed a person who had been absolutely harmed by domestic violence. Um, her mother, I'm not going to the, too many of the details of the case, but she had been beaten so badly that um, she now lives in a care home and has um, dementia. Her daughter um, has no recourse. She's watching her mother disintegrate, and we have COVID, and she can't get to visit her very often. Um, and I see her as a very definite victim of harm. She didn't live in the house. She wasn't beaten. 
but she's now living with the fact that she feels so guilty that she didn't protect her parent. She wasn't able to stop that abuse and now her mother's dying in front of her. Um, so harm is horrendous. Harm is something that it's very hard to put a finger on. It's very hard to define. And I know that when the domestic abuse um, bill was being considered across in Westminster that there were many other options that were added in. And Mr Frew has mentioned some of those and he talked about strangulation and he talked about um, you know, um, you know, rough sex. Those are things that, that are within that intimate relationship between a man and a woman, a man and a man, a woman and a woman. Um, but there are those implications and this bill is trying to deal with it when it comes to children of victims. Um, and I have to say that children of victims, while they may be under 18 and mentioned in this, adults who have been children within a family where domestic violence has taken place carries that with them. Unfortunately, in my lifetime, I've spent some time with charities who have worked with those children um, who are out the other end. They've grown up and they've moved away. And you will see the same course of behaviour happening. You will see the same situations happening within households. Some girls are prepared to put up with so much. Some men are prepared to do so much. And it's, it's, it's sickening. And that's why whenever this bill is coming forward, and that importance of Clause 3 is there, because as the Minister had mentioned before, this is about criminalising the behaviour as opposed to just the outcome. And this is why it's so important. There's other things, for instance, that we can talk about harm. For instance, there's some things in, in, that's not a crime at the moment. Like, for instance, and it talk, they talked about it in Westminster in some of the papers that I read, that if someone discloses sexual intimate photographs of a person, that's a crime. But to threaten to do that is not. So you can have control over a person without physically doing something to them. And you may have that psychological harm, but there's no way, there's no criminal offence to say, I'm going to share photographs of you. Being harmed isn't covered in law, but this part of the bill is about the impact on the victim. In Northern Ireland, we already see things and are doing things to help protect victims. For instance, in the welfare benefits system, we have already separated welfare benefits because we recognise the threat of harm, of economic control, and yet we don't have anything in law to recognise it's the impact to victims. And I think it's, it's right that we have that and it's right that it's included. I thank those that have brought forward amendments. Um, Mr Frew, Ms Woods, um, absolutely. The, the type of considerations that have been made for this bill are so important because all of you could be like me and sitting in your office in any day of the week and a victim walks in and it could be for something as simple as a food bank voucher. It could be for something as simple as asking about a school place for a special education needs um, student. And you end up in a conversation with that person and you hear what has been going on with them for years. I sincerely hope that this bill will be passed as quickly as possible. So the lady that was in my office and her mother who has now left, not remembering her daughter's name or where she's living at, or that the abuse actually happened to her, that there are no more of those types of victims. And I would encourage all, let's get this done. I know this will be a long debate tonight. There will be a lot of groups out there listening to this debate and hoping that we take this forward as quickly as possible. And I ask all of you to work together with the minister, with the committee, and let's get this passed as quickly as possible. Thank you. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I, like others, would like to begin my remarks by thanking all of the individuals, organisations that submitted evidence to the committee, the committee staff for all of their hard work, and the members who scrutinised the bill in great detail, to the Minister for bringing it forward, and to Claire Sugden for starting this process. Paul has probably already made my arguments for me, so I could probably just sit back down, but I'm not going to. Um, and I'm only going to address the amendments to Clause 9, and those are Amendments 3 to 7. Um, and it brings us back to second stage, and it's what I said at second stage. If we want to give our children the best start in life, we must also look to the effects of domestic abuse on them and ensure that the home is a place of safety for children and young people now and for the future. Domestic violence, as we know, has a de devastating impact on children and young people that can last into adulthood, and Kelly Armstrong has outlined her experience with constituent to that. And it, 
A UNICEF report estimated that as many as 275 million children worldwide are exposed to violence in the home. And children are often hidden victims of domestic abuse, and the long-term impact on children includes a detrimental impact to their mental health, child development, risk of harmful sexual behaviour, future cycles of abuse, and potential for youth offending. And it's important that legislation reflects that a child can be aware of and negatively impacted by domestic abuse in the home, even if they do not see or hear the moment in which it occurs. Children can pick up on parents' distress or be impacted by the parents' compromised capacity for parenting in the context of fear. Threats to hurt and abuse children are often used as part of the course of behaviour that seeks to control, isolate or frighten the victim. Crucially, this is what the amendments are to capture. So to Clause 9, which has been debated extensively by the committee, and I'm sure some members will be glad when I stop talking about Clause 9. I'm looking to the Chair in particular. Um, but of course I would make that assumption based on my own experience of it. Clause 9 provides for the domestic abuse offence to be aggravated where it involves a child. Under the clause, as it's currently drafted, the aggravation would apply where it has been shown that either the perpetrator directed behaviour at the child or the perpetrator made use of the child in directing behaviour at the victim or the child saw or heard or was present during an incident of behaviour. Therefore, in order for the aggravation to be applied, one of these conditions would have to be met and appropriately evidenced by the prosecution. The first option to apply the aggravation is clear, where the accused abused the child. The second option, where the accused made use of the child in the abuse of the victim, may include instances where, as mentioned in the committee report, the accused directs a child to spy on the day-to-day -day activities of the victim or alleged victim, so as to enable the accused to control or monitor their movements and interactions. And the third option is also clear, when the child sees, hears or was present during incidents of abuse. The committee engaged with many children and young people's organisations as part of its evidence gathering. Hearing a variety of concerns with the legislation and ideas for moving forward with regard to children's rights and their safety and well-being from abuse. And this included discussions of abuse in the home, between family members, in youth relationships, parental responsibility and child abuse. And organisations such as Women's Aid also pointed to the realities of domestic abuse in the home and the experiences of many that involved their children, with perpetrators directing their abuse towards the children to hurt and control them. In effect, members, this is coercive control. Not every instance of domestic abuse will be heard or seen by a child, but that does not mean that they cannot be affected by it. And that does not mean that a perpetrator's actions are any less harmful, nor should this mean that the aggravator in Clause 9 shouldn't apply. A number of organisations raised concerns with Clause 9 over the wording and its potential operation, and I do intend to outline a few, for the information, for a few of these for the consideration of other members. Women's Aid stated in 9.2b, where the child saw, heard or was present, does not adequately address the issue or recognise the persistent, ongoing nature of the impact of the abuse on a child living in a home with domestic violence and abuse and call for children to be recognised as victims in their own right and not as associated persons. Action for Children agreed with this assessment by Women's Aid, noting that the experience of these children and young people are often overlooked. Bernardo's highlighted the importance of recognising that a child can be aware and impacted by domestic abuse in the home, even if they do not see or hear it. Bernardo specifically mentioned 9.2b in this regard and suggested that it should be expanded to recognise that children do not need to witness the abuse to be negatively affected. The Children's Law Centre also recommended extra provision in Clause 9 to account for circumstances where the child does not directly witness an incident but still has been aware of or affected by the abuse. Nikki reiterated the fact that children are adversely affected by domestic abuse beyond occasions when they only see or hear an incident and called for further consideration of how this could be reflected for in legislation. Nikki also noted that the Scottish Act provides that children do not have to be aware of or understand the nature of the abusive behaviour for the aggravation to apply 
and this provision effectively captures the impact on children who may, for instance, reside in a different household from that in which the abuse occurs. The NSPCC also noted that the Scottish legislation on which Clause 9 is based includes a reasonable person test, which means that the aggravation can be applied where a reasonable person would consider the abuse likely to adversely affect a child. They say that this provision was included in the Scottish Act in large part to avoid children have, having to give evidence about their experiences in court. And for that reason, the NSPCC recommended adding the reasonable person test in Clause 9. The Human Rights Commission agreed that children could only, should only provide evidence directly to the court when absolutely necessary, and where this is done, an age-appropriate manner with consideration to given alternatives such as live links. It is also recommending age-appropriate counselling for the child before, during and after the trial. The Bar Library indicated that the current wording of 9.2b would suggest, in practical terms, the child being required to give evidence as to their awareness of the accused's behaviour and any in, in, adverse impact caused by it. The Bar also noted the similarities between Clause 9 and provisions of the Scottish Act and queried why the Department did not include subsections similar to that legislation that would address the concerns and issues raised. Specifically, 5.5 of the Scottish Act, which reads, for it to be proved that the offence is so aggravated, there does not need to be evidence that the child A has ever had any awareness of A's behaviour or understanding the nature of A's behaviour. In response to the sheer weight of the evidence, the initial refusal of the Department to properly consider the concerns and issues raised, not just by me or by Mr Frew for that matter, but the concerns of all those that I have mentioned, is frankly baffling. When the committee reiterated these concerns and suggested possible solutions, the Department claimed that the conditions for applying the aggravation under Clause 9 as drafted were wider in scope than the Scottish provisions because there is no requirement for a reasonable person to consider that the abusive behaviour would adversely impact the child. The view was that the requirement in this bill is simply that the child sees, hears or is present during an incident of abuse. In other words, less hoops to jump through in order to apply the aggravation in comparison to Scotland. As mentioned in the committee report, we discussed the wording of Clause 9, and in particular 9.2, extensively with officials. And I continually, continually press for an explanation as to why the Department's rationale for adopting a different approach to the Scottish legislation with regard to this clause. And to this day, I do not believe that I or the committee have been given a satisfactory explanation. It was continually reiterated that the three options for applying the aggravation they, and stated that they did not consider an amendment reflecting the additional provisions of the Scottish legislation was required. In my view, this represents a complete disregard for the evidence that was in front of the Department. Needless to say, the Committee began work on an amendment to strengthen the clause and also asked whether the Department would consider adding greater clarity by amending the EFM to address the concerns. And after considering the Committee's draft amendment, the Department reiterated their stance that Clause 9 as drafted had less hoops to jump through to apply the aggravation in comparison to Scotland and that the proposed committee amendment would be unnecessary, adding nothing to the clause and could risk confusing matters. It was not us that was confused. After further discussions between the committee and the officials on the 24th of September, the Department advised that their interpretation of the Scottish legislation was wrong and therefore the advice given to committee up until that point was incorrect. The Department apologised for the error and clarified how the Scottish provisions work. The crux of the mistake and the misinterpretation of the Scottish provisions had actually formed the basis of the Department's rebuttal of the recommendations and suggestions that were based on the evidence provided by all stakeholders up until that point. This should not be glossed over. The Department claimed correctly that there were three options to apply the aggravation under Clause 9 as drafted, and they also claimed that this was preferable to the Scottish legislation because under the provisions of their Act, the options they apply the aggravations were coupled with the requirement of a reasonable person to consider the abuse to adversely affect the child. But that was wrong. The reasonable person test is in fact an additional option to apply the aggravation in circumstances or cases where the other three may not apply. So a further option to apply the aggravation that exists in Scotland, but the Department removed, 
because it wasn't understood and it was an unnecessary hoop to get through. That meant, with Clause 9 as drafted, we will have no option to apply the aggravator where a reasonable person would consider the abuse to adversely affect the child. It is not possible to apply it using the other three options. To be clear, this provision does exist in Scotland. So we would be left, essentially, with a legislative gap. Even though the error was acknowledged before the committee had finalised report, its report, remarkably, there was no solution offered to this gap other than suggesting that they would add some wording to the bill's explanatory notes to clarify that the child did not have to be aware or understand the abuse. But as we know, members, the EFM is not legislation. We were left then with a suboptimal clause compared to Scotland and weaknesses in the bill with respect to the operation of the child aggravation. It is also worth noting that two days after I had published my amendments to Clause 9 at the 11th hour, so to speak, Ta alternative amendments were tables, which is important to mention, but the committee had no notice of and were only able to discuss by virtue of the postponement of consideration stage debate. So I welcome yesterday's letter to the committee outlining she will not be moving our amendments today, specifically amendments five and six. And I also put, my record, or put on my record my thanks to Mr Frew, who stuck to his word and added his name to the amendments I had tabled and for his ongoing commentary, scrutiny and support on this. While the, members, the Minister's amendments reflect similar provisions in Scotland, it is not clear why a residency con condition is included, given that the scope of our offence differs so greatly in the sense that it applies to a much broader range of personal connections and relationships beyond simply partners and ex-partners, which is captured in the Scottish law. The Minister's amendments added another hoop to jump through, an unnecessary condition that the Department, throughout this whole debate on Clause 9, were seeking to avoid. There is nothing anywhere else in this Bill that states those involved in abuse or affected by it have to be a resident in a particular place. So why is this in now? What if the child lived with Granny? A child could live with C visits A and B regularly, perhaps stays over, but does not reside with A or B or both. Perhaps the child is next door with the headphones on during an incident. Perhaps A abuses B, but the child does not see, hear or were present. What would happen then? Contrary to the further confusion and uncertainty that would ensue, ensue with the residency condition, I believe that myself and now Mr Paul Frew's amendments would finally put clause nine to bed and I would urge all members to support them. I will. I thank the member for giving way. Um, and again, I, I will hold this up as an exemplar of how MLAs work together in a common, common purpose to achieve something good. But can I say to the member that it would, also, uh, it would also lead to the example that we may all be common with in that when granny or granda sees conflict or sees a problem in the household, they then encourage the child to stay with granny and granda as much as possible. And even the victim would encourage that as much as possible. So you get a scenario where MB's child stays with granny as often as they can to get them away from the, the, the scenario and the household where the violence and the abuse of uh, nature is taking place. And they would not be encapsulated in this clause if it was left unamended. I thank the member for his intervention, and it is the impact on the children that we must look at as well. You know, this, we, we have to do we have so much to do with this bill, but we have to put the victims, alleged victims, and the children at the centre of this. And in terms of your comments about working together, I do look forward to working together with you in the future, um, and certainly uh, happy to do so, especially when we have common ground. <laughs> um, but my first amendment, Amendment 4, deals with a very specific issue raised during discussions between the committee and the officials, and Mr Frew in particular, who was seeking clarity about what scenarios would fall under 92A2, a made use of the child in directing behaviour at B. The committee sought clarity from officials that this position, provision would capture circumstances where the accused had threatened to abuse the child as part of the course of abusive behaviour directed at the victim. This, unfortunately, is a common occurrence in domestic abuse cases where children are involved. And it is my view that this amendment provides the clarity that is required. Clause 9 as drafted does not take into account the specific issue explicitly in its wording, which clearly would, should fall under one of the options to apply the aggravation. And in my view, it sits clearly within 92A1. 
I believe this strengthens the clause by making clear that threats to abuse children, to abuse children will be captured by the aggravator and it sends a clear signal from this place that such abusive behaviour should be treated with the utmost severity. My second amendment to clause 9, which is in amendment 7, resolves the mess and confusion tied to the misinterpretation of the Scottish legislation and it fills the legislative gap that I have outlined. And it means the aggravation can be applied where the other options do not apply, but where a reasonable person would consider the abuse to have adversely affected the child. Subsection 2A of the amendment works in the same way as it does for the offence, to reflect the child may not be aware of how the abuse has impacted them, or even aware that abuse is abuse. The subsection is also crucial to avoid in a scenario where the prosecution is forced to rely on evidence given by the child in court in order for the aggravation to be applied. 2B does not take anything away from this provision but clarifies that nothing in 2A prevents people from consulting the child or young person. It is not a requirement for evidence but a simple clarification. There are clearly times when we do need to reflect the child's voice as well as deploying adequate protections and support which is covered in different parts of the bill but there is nothing in this amendment that forces or even encourages children to have given evidence. This is all covered in 2A. Not all children see, hear or be present during incidences of abuse. Not all perpetrators make use of children in abusing their victims. And not all perpetrators abuse children directly. And yet there are many, many ways that domestic abuse negatively impacts children. And we must make sure that this is captured and reflected in the legislation and in the sentencing. This is about coercive control. There are victims with a dependent child who are suffering from economic abuse leading to financial strain and inability to provide for the child. There is psychological abuse or coercive control where the child has never witnessed behaviour but the effects on the victim, victim have a knock-on effect for the child in terms of reduced capacity to provide care, support the child's basic needs and so on. The Scottish provisions are there for a reason. The Scottish clause itself, according to one key stakeholder in that jurisdiction, was a significant compromise between those who wanted to see children treated as victims in their own right and those who had reservations about attempting to do so within that legislation. We cannot and should not accept any lesser provisions than what exists, exist elsewhere. We should, not be, we should be bringing forward the best possible legislation for the people of Northern Ireland. These amendments would mean that the aggravation could be applied where a reasonable person considers the domestic abuse to likely have a negative effect on the child and would help prevent the potential where well, many children having to give evidence in court where they would be forced to relive trauma that they have already suffer, suffered. Therefore, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would encourage all members to support amendments 4 and 7. I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I note the Minister's comments at the weekend. Um, and what I would say to her is to keep going, because it's certainly not my job to finish uh, this bill. Um, and we, we are depending on her doing that, because, as Mr. Frew had said, this bill is three years too late. Um, I, I, I rise to speak um, particularly of Amendment 1 and the opposition to Clause 3. Um, I'm happy to support all other amendments. Um, I was going to speak briefly first on Amendment 9, um, but uh, Ms Woods has covered all the detail that I had intended to cover, um, so um, I, I don't need to go over that again. But what I will say in relation to Amendment 9, um, I would thank the Minister for uh, specifically including the aggravating offence um, in relation to children within the Domestic Abuse Bill. Um, I, I think we all know, and others have spoken about it, that domestic abuse is a form of trauma, and it's a trauma that will perpetuate a cycle, maybe even a cycle of domestic abuse. If children are seeing that happening within the family home, the damage that that causes, you know, we only need to look toward our criminal justice system to recognise the trauma that exists within that, and domestic abuse is a form of that trauma. So I do commend the Minister for, for committing to take that forward, and you know, I, I, no doubt the, the, the House will uh, support that amendment uh, this evening. I don't intend uh, to uh, support uh, Mr Alistair's amendment or indeed his opposition to Clause 3. I do, however, wish to talk to it because um, I do recognise and respect his experience, practical experience, um, in a previous career in relation to uh, application of the law and the application of criminal law. And my comments around this are not to be an obstacle to these oppositions or the actions that Mr. Uh, or, or, or that this House would take, but really to ensure that we are right in what we are doing, because I think. 
you know, legislation is one thing, we can get it onto statute, but it's the implementation which is really critical to this. And I think he does raise valid concerns in relation to the harm and the reasonable uh, person who consider that harm. The other point I would make as well is in relation to the comments that Mr Frew made. He rightly says that this bill doesn't actually mention coercive control and I'd be keen to hear the Minister's thoughts as to why that wasn't included. Maybe there's a real practical legal consideration as to why that wasn't included but perhaps that would provide clarity to the concerns that Mr Alistair is raising. Because let me put this out here and I am going to play devil's advocate here. We put this clause in assuming that the victim doesn't know what, this, what harm is, yet we assume a reasonable person would. What does that mean? What does harm mean? And I appreciate, and I spoke to the Minister briefly before the debate, about potentially creating a definition of harm within law. But I, I, I recognise that that can have its own limitations and it can constrain the interpretation of what harm is. So I, I think we do need to be very careful on, on what we mean by that and what this uh, this a piece was intended. Trying to kind of crystallise um, the, this group of am uh, amendments and, and, and this section of the bill, um, it's essentially in three elements. There's intent, there is the, the action or abuse, or others have described it as behaviour, and then the last bit is the harm. And it's the last bit of the harm which essentially conveys the sense of course of control that hasn't yet been defined in Northern Ireland law previously. And of course I support that. It was my intention when I made it my overarching priority because I do recognise that psychological abuse often leads to more serious forms of abuse. But that abuse in itself, you know, every, every member in this chamber will have heard the phrase, you know, the, the scars heal, the wounds heal but it's the mental torture that I have to live with for the rest of our lives. And that's not just an impact for the individual, but it's an impact for wider society and the implications that that has. So I, I think the intent around the harm is absolutely right, but do we need to go further in defining it so that when it comes down to the practical application of the law in a criminal court, this will actually be able to be applied? Because I think that's the worst thing that we could do here. We could give victims of domestic abuse hope, and then when they go through that awful process, of criminal justice and then to be found that actually this isn't going to be upheld in a court of law. I don't know. This hasn't been applied here before. I spoke with the minister and she suggested that you know we're, it's not just on the basis of the words on paper, it's on the basis of precedent, it's on the basis of other decisions that had previously happened. And I'd be keen to hear if there are any examples of that, just to give me comfort that the application of how this is written will actually have a practical effect whenever we take it through the, 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 the courts. I suppose to kind of add a bit of a human side to it, I, I suppose why I can't ultimately support um Mr. Allister's amendment is, is that I would, it would give rise to me for concerns of what impact that would have on the victim. So if, if we're talking about um, harm, psychological and physical harm, how do we determine that in a court of law? Is that something that we have that a, a medical practitioner, for example, has to be able to state as the case? And are there, are, then are we also are we getting into a situation where the victim becomes the person we're investigating, rather than the person who's perpetrating the offence? And you know, I, I'm quite keen if Mr. Alistair wishes to intervene, if he has any thoughts on that. Yep. The harm, as drafted in my amendment, can be physical or psychological. Physical harm might speak for itself, but I would have thought in any case such as this, particularly psychological harm, it would be entirely appropriate, just as if it was an assault case, that there would be medical evidence called as part of the prosecution. Uh, if someone is charged with assault occasioning actual bodily harm or grievous bodily harm, you would expect a medical report, often agreed, but if not contested by the evidence being called, and more, more particularly, if there is an allegation of psychological harm, it almost inevitably would lead, to, as part of the proofs of the prosecution, to the calling of uh, evidence from a medical expert. Um, I, I appreciate the, the member's intervention, um, and you know, I, I suppose these are the, the thoughts that I am having when we are looking at this in terms of the practical application. Because yes, I, I do absolutely recognise the sentiment of this. Um, no one more in this house um, wants this to become statute, you know, the minister herself, of course, but this is something that I have been advocating for for four or five years, and it, it is long before time that we need to get this onto the statute. But again, I think we would be doing a great disservice to, to the victims of domestic abuse if we 
can't put onto the statute something which will actually be workable, in which the police can understand, which the public prosecution service can understand, and I appreciate there is an amendment in relation to training around that. But what about the general public? There's no reference into, in this bill in relation to a public awareness campaign, and maybe that's something that we need to strengthen around the training of this. I'm not saying we're training the general public on this, but I suppose where I'm sympathetic to Mr Alistair's comments around the the interpretation of that particular line is that we are assuming that people know what this is. People don't know what course of control is, which is why it has been able to grip victims for so long. So I'm not saying that we should necessarily object to what's within this bill, but I do wonder, is there anything that we can do to try and strengthen this? And maybe it is adding in a public awareness so that that reasonable person will be able to make a reasonable assumption about what this actually is. You know, I, I speak to many people and you, know, you can nearly challenge them on their own behaviour and they would, they would be the first to, hope to say, I don't behave like that. But then when we describe what that behaviour is, they do start to think twice about it. So you know, alongside this, I would certainly encourage the Minister to maybe look at allowing that reasonable person, if you like, to understand what this is. So so that maybe Mr Alistair wouldn't have the same objection, because I do understand the ambiguity there, and I don't think that we can do that uh, to victims. I suppose ironically, and I know they're almost mutually exclusive, but I, d I, I don't support his opposition to Clause 3, because to come back to the point, the harm element of this section of the bill is to me essentially the course of control element, and that was the intent and the purpose around this. Um, so I think by putting that in, what we're doing here in Northern Ireland is creating a new, a new offence here that um, is really important and will actually pave the way for, uh, for hopefully less instances of domestic abuse. However, again, I'll come back to that uh, particular line in... in uh, so, yeah, go ahead, sure. Thank the member for giving way. And she is right in, in highlighting the fact that this is the first time that we're putting down in legislation domestic abuse offence. Um, and, and you know, whilst we want to try and get the best law possible, we do also recognise that in our jurisdictions they've had another go at this, and another go at this, and that may well be the case here, that we, knew we need to strengthen something or we need to add something more vigorous. Uh, so I wouldn't rule that out, and I think that's, that's why it's so important with regards to the monitoring and the reporting of this offence. No, and I appreciate that, but you know, if there's an opportunity to get this right in this instance, then we will prevent more victims. And I suppose they've had the experience of seeing it in action and seeing where its limitations were so that they have had to be able to go back and improve that bill. We're in a fortunate position, if you can call it that, where we've had three years of seeing how it has worked in our other jurisdictions, and perhaps maybe we can do something to ensure that we don't have to come back at this for a second time, because our mistakes will will affect lives and I, I, I think if, if there is something we can do to strengthen this, I'm not saying remove it, I'm saying strengthen it and you know, I, I, would be, I, I don't know the answers in this, I, I haven't had the same focus as I would have had had I been in the role. Um, I do appreciate the attention that the Justice Committee has given, I really do appreciate the, the, the evidence that, that the victims have put forward, I can't imagine how difficult that has been, you know, to, to an extent it may have re-traumatised them but if they're working towards trying to ensure that this doesn't happen to someone else, I think that's the biggest uh, compliment that we can give them. So, um, as I said, I, I really just would encourage the Minister to look at this. Um, I talked about harm. I'd asked her in a, a, a topical question earlier about harm and how we define that within law. Um, and, you know, I just think we do have to be cognizant of the fact that perhaps people, a reasonable person, wouldn't understand what we understand. Um, because you know we are in a position, we, we, we have been given information, we have requested information, we understand it. But People outside of this building may not. So is there a way that we can strengthen their understanding so that what we have here will actually work in practice? Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I now call on the Minister of Justice, Ms Naomi Long, to respond to the debate in uh, Group 1 debate. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, and if I may briefly, I want to put on record my thanks um, to the Justice Committee, the Chair and the Vice Chair, for their assistance in progressing the Bill to consideration stage, particularly during what has been quite a challenging time. Their scrutiny has been robust and diligent, and as they have said themselves, is an exemplar of best practice in regards to committee legislative scrutiny. I look forward to us continuing to work together as the Bill progresses through its final stages in the House. Thanks also are due to the Committee staff 
for facilitating not just engagement with my department, but also the many witnesses, some of whom were also victims of domestic abuse, in making their contribution to this bill, because it is for them that we do this. I would also like to thank all the stakeholders and victims and survivors that provided evidence and helped to shape the bill. We want, we, I am determined and have been determined since taking up office that I want to deliver for them and with them so that we provide the best possible legislation. I also want to put on record my thanks to Claire Sugden for her work on this bill while she was Justice Minister and also thank my own officials who are passionate and dedicated to addressing domestic abuse. They have, despite challenging circumstances, maintained focus and pace, not just in the last few months, but over recent years. And legislation is only one part of the work which they do. I thank the committee and those members also who have brought forward amendments, and I look forward to debating these issues during the proceedings today. Mr Sp Deputy Speaker, for too many people, home is not a safe place. Instead, it is a place of hurt, of fear, a situation that has been exacerbated during the current pandemic. Now it is more important than ever that we work together to put an end to domestic abuse and coercive controlling behaviour. The most recent police statistics from August 2020 show that during the period of the 1st of July 2019 to the 30th of June 2020, there were 32,127 32, domestic abuse incidents reported in Northern Ireland. This represents a 1.8% increase from the previous year and the highest level on record since reporting began in 2004-2005. Uh, Furthermore, the police recorded that 18,796 domestic abuse crimes during this same period, and that shows an increase of 13.3% during the previous year and one of the highest levels since reporting began. That equates to 17 domestic abuse incidents and 10 crimes committed per 1,000 pounds of the, 1, um, of the Northern Ireland population. It is important also that we note that these are only the reported figures. Many more victims are suffering across Northern Ireland but cannot do or do not feel able to report it to the police. It is important too that we recognise that it is for these people that we are doing this work. We also have seen an increase in male victims during this period, an increase of victims in the younger and older age groups. And it is important that we recognise that not all domestic abuse involves a current or former partner, but it can also, in around 35% of crimes, involve another familial relationship. Mr Speaker, I think it's important to put that on record as we debate this, because it is for those people that we are here today. Mr Speaker, before I turn to my own amendments in this group, I want to address the amendments proposed by Jim Allister. Amendment 1 would remove the condition contained in the domestic abuse offence that a reasonable person would be required to consider the course of behaviour to be likely to cause another person to suffer any physical or psychological harm. It replaces this with a condition that the person must suffer physical and psychological harm for the offence to apply. We had quite a long discussion um, earlier in respect of why I don't believe that that is the case, and so I'm not going to labour the point at this stage. In the same vein, Mr Allister has given notice of his intention to oppose the question that Clause 3 stand part of the Bill. Clause 3, as it stands, provides that an individual does not need to have actually suffered physical or psychological harm for the offence to be committed. It also states that it is not necessary for the effects of the behaviour covered by Clause 2, such as dependency, subordination, isolation or control, to have actually been suffered by the partner or connected person for the offence to be committed. This is because a reasonable person test applies in relation to physical or psychological harm and relevant effects. The proposed amendment to Clause 1 and the removal of Clause 3 would fundamentally and detrimentally alter the nature of the offence and the Bill. We would be unable to provide protection and indeed secure justice in some of the most horrific cases where an individual is suffering ongoing and extensive non-physical abuse but has normalised this within their own mind. It would also fail to recognise this insidious and invading nature of domestic abuse 
and how it fundamentally operates where physical violence is not present. As I have advised the House previously, I consider these provisions are vital in the fight against domestic abuse and ensuring that the focus continues to be on the abusive behaviour of the offender and not the harm caused. It would be a travesty, Mr Deputy Speaker, were someone to be not guilty of domestic abuse despite carrying out a prolonged and a detailed form of abuse on a person simply because that person was resilient. That would be completely wrong. And so it is important that we recognise that it is the action, just as I said earlier, the action of getting behind the steering wheel of a car and driving when intoxicated with alcohol is in itself an offence. It does not have to lead to harm in order for someone to be prosecuted. So I think it is important that we understand the distinction that it is the course of action that we are criminalising, not the outcome. Many people up and down this country are suffering abusive behaviour day in and day out, but they have never known anything different. They accept it as normal and consider in some cases that this is just how relationships work. For those who know anything of this, a prime example is the case of the Hart brothers, and a number of members have made reference to that tragic case today, whose mother and sister were killed by their father. The Domestic Abuse Homicide Review stated that they had been suffering intense domestic abuse for many years and did not know this as there was no physical abuse, perfectly illustrating the type of behaviours the bill is intended to cover. The focus must remain on the actions of the offender. That is whether there is abusive behaviour. A reasonable person that we consider would cause harm and that it has been carried out intentionally or recklessly to that effect. It is vital that offenders cannot escape justice because a victim has become so used to having their movements controlled, contact with family or friends restricted, and that it does not um, necessarily any longer cause them fear, alarm or distress. Further, in relation um, to Paul Frew's comments about why we opted not to state specific terms such as coercive control, um, gaslighting, technological or financial abuse in the legislation. To do so, as he rightly said, would lead to um, a defence that because it has not been listed in the legislation, it is not an offence. And of course, how people control and abuse individuals um, is often complex and changes over time. Any list could become dated. It could also become a hierarchy, suggesting that some forms of abuse are more concerning than others. Mr Alistair has also previously raised concern that even if there is no complaint of abuse and no objective finding of harm, that a person could be sent to jail for 14 years and that this would be disproportionate. If a serious and prolonged course of action designed to intimidate and threaten has not happened, and there is no evidence that it has happened, a person would not be subject to the maximum penalty. Suggesting that people will end up in jail for 14 years for doing nothing, essentially, or that someone against whom there is no coherent or cohesive evidence will be prosecuted is a false logic. I will, yes. One, one of the specific examples of this is when the Hart brothers talked to the, the point that one of them had a nut allergy and their father brought nuts into the home and just sat them on the kitchen shelf, knowing that their mother would know what that meant. Now that in itself would not be enough to make a case against somebody but along with all of the other actions, it certainly would. In, the, in that circumstance, it was very clear what it was about. That would not be the case in every home where nuts would be brought in where somebody has a nut allergy. And that is precisely the point, that incidences and activities that may look innocent from outside within the context of an abusive relationship can take on a very different colour. We have spoken with, with victims who have said that when they are out in company, their partner is absolutely perfectly fine, but that if they transgress against the rules that are being imposed on them um, in order to be able to go out in public, they will whistle a tune or hum a song. Things that to an outside observer would appear trivial, but to that person, 
has significance because they know the consequences of those actions. And we have to capture this behaviour. We have to make sure that people who are being subjected to a, con a consistent and persistent line of abuse are not able um, to allow that to continue with no law to back them up. It is also important to remember that inherent to the domestic abuse offence are a number of thresholds and safeguards, checks and balances that must be met before the test for the offence is met, because Mr Allister is right. Alleged victims and alleged um, perpetrators have the right to a fair trial, and it is important that there, is therefore, uh, that there are therefore safeguards and checks and balances. The behaviour must con be considered to be abusive. A reasonable person would have to consider that it would cause harm, and the person must either intend to cause harm or be reckless to this. Importantly, there are safeguards associated with this defence, with a defence where if the behaviour is considered reasonable in the particular circumstances of the case, it is not um, considered part of this offence. So I do not support this amendment, and I would call on the House to reject it. Should the amendment be made, we will have failed in our bid to protect those who suffer from domestic abuse. Moving now to my amendments in this group, Mr Deputy Speaker. Amendment 2 is a minor drafting amendment to neaten a small aspect of wording in relation to Clause 8, aggravation where the victim is under 18. I propose that constituting the offence is replaced by virtue of which the offence is constituted. This does not re represent a material change to the provisions, rather is simply intended to reflect the fact that the course of behaviour is not the sole element of the domestic abuse offence and avoids giving the sense that the behaviour alone constitutes an offence. This is similarly the case in relation to Amendment 8. Coming then to Clause 9, an aggravation where a relevant child is involved. I need to make clear, Mr Speaker, that um, Clause 9 does not cause behaviour to be abusive. It establishes aggravation of the offence for sentencing purposes. I have tabled three amendments to Clause 9 of the Bill, Numbers 3, 5 and 6, on aggravation where a relevant child is involved. The purpose of the three amendments was to make the provisions around the child aggravator as robust as possible in discussions with the committee, with amendments five and six intended to address concerns that have been raised previously by some Justice Committee members. There has been extensive debate on these clauses, including at a committee session that I attended last week, and I have listened to the concerns raised by some members that amendment six, as regards residency, would damage the bill, for example, where a child resides elsewhere, such as via kinship care um, or other arrangements. Having reflected further on this, and as already advised the Justice Committee, I therefore do not intend to move Amendments 5 and 6, and so that means that the decision of the House is on the alternative Amendment 7 um, from Rachel Woods and Paul Frew. I welcome the alternative amendment, which, with, which, with the exception of a residency requirement, makes for similar provision to my amendments. Amendment number three will make explicit that the child aggravator can be applied if any or all of the limbs of the child aggravator are present. That is where behaviour is directed at the child or use is made of them to direct behaviour at the victim, where a child saw, heard or was present for the abusive behaviour, or where a reasonable person would consider the behaviour to be likely to adversely affect the child. While it is considered that any or all of the aggravators could apply in the current draft, I want to make it explicit and clear that this is the case, that a number of the aggravating aspects may apply at any one time. As I have just mentioned, I will not move my second amendment to Clause 9, Amendment number 5, which provided that the aggravator would also apply if a reasonable person would consider the course of behaviour or an incident of behaviour which the accused directed at a victim as part of the course of behaviour to be likely to adversely affect the child. This is, however, captured within Amendment No. 7, the purpose of which is to provide that, for example, where the abuse controls the victim's movements to such an extent that they are unable to leave the house to ensure their children get to school or to get them to doctor's appointments, the court could determine that this would amount to behaviour likely to adversely affect a child. It could also cover circumstances where the effect of the abusive behaviour is such that a reasonable person would consider it likely that a child's general well-being and development would be adversely affected. In terms of my third and final amendment to Clause 9, Amendment 6, again, I do not intend to move it. Similar to Amendment 5, I think it is captured within Amendment 7. This will provide that there does not need to be evidence that a child ever had any awareness or understanding of, or actually have been adversely affected by the accused's behaviour for the aggravator to apply. 
It does not, however, prevent evidence of this being laid before the courts. These provisions will have the added benefit of reducing the likelihood of a child having to give evidence at court, albeit that good practice should already seek to reduce that in as far as is possible. The House will wish to note that my Amendment 5 would have had a condition that for the reasonable person aspect of the aggravator, the child would have to live with the victim or offender. This was simply intended to reflect the fact that living in an environment in which domestic abuse is carried out is what is most likely to adversely affect a child. However, having reflected on the concerns raised by committee members who viewed that as damaging to the bill, I am content that this does not form part of the provisions. For that reason, Amendments 5 and 6 will not be moved. I consider that my Amendment 3, along with Amendment 7, provide robust provisions to ensure that the impact of domestic abuse on children can be fully reflected in the sentencing that a court may impose. And so I would ask the House to support both of those amendments. Turning to Amendment 4, which has been tabled by Rachel Woods and Paul Frew, this would amend Clause 9 to provide that the child aggravator would also apply if at any time in the commission of the offence the accused threatened to direct behaviour at a child. While I consider the threatening behaviour aspect is captured by the offence already, with the child aggravator then applying to this, this provision would make that aspect explicit, and for that reason, I will support the amendment and ask the House to do the same. Mr. Speaker, amendment number 10 makes an addition to clause 13, the alternatives available for conviction, to state that this section is without prejudice to section 62 of the Criminal Law Act, Northern Ireland, 1967, alternative verdicts on a trial and indictment. This amendment is for the avoidance of doubt as to the effect of Clause 13 on Section 62 of that Act, which contains general provisions for alternative verdicts in indictment proceedings, and that there can be no cross-contamination between the two enactments. Mr Speaker, I am proposing two amendments to Clause 25 in response to a request from the Justice Committee. The first amendment, number 16, provides that my department must, rather than may, issue guidance. I would like to stress there was never any doubt that guidance would be prepared, and work on this is already well underway. A second meeting of the multi-agency task and finish group was held yesterday to consider the revised content of the guidance, and good progress is being made in relation to that. Secondly, Amendment No. 17 provides that guidance issued by my apartment will include such other matters as it considers appropriate as to criminal law or procedure relating to domestic abuse in Northern Ireland. At present, the clause refers only to other matters as to criminal law or procedure relating to domestic abuse in Northern Ireland. In concluding, Mr Deputy Speaker, a number of issues cannot be addressed by the Justice Department alone. It will require other ministers to also contribute, and so I want to put on record my appreciation for the support and cooperation of other ministers in government, not only for this bill, but for their ongoing support for the wider domestic abuse landscape and the domestic abuse strategy, which will take many of those forward. That includes issues such as the public awareness raising campaign, uh, which uh, Claire Sugden has raised, and which my department is, in which my department is already heavily engaged. That campaign is to raise awareness of domestic abuse in our society, to challenge preconceptions of who may be a victim or perpetrator, and to increase confidence from the public that they should intervene and report when they believe that domestic abuse is occurring. Indeed, in response to the COVID pandemic, we invested additional resources into addressing public um, communications. Mr Speaker, I think this has been a useful debate today. I think it has been a helpful one, um, and I am happy that that concludes at this stage my comments on this group of amendments. I now call on Jim Allister to wind the debate on the Group 1 amendments. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I hope I don't have to say this, but I will say it. That um, I'm not interested in providing any refuge for any domestic abuser. Domestic abuse is insidious, it's iniquitous, and it deserves the full rigour of the law. But I am interested in the sanctity of the criminal law, and that's why I laid out my arguments. I acknowledge I have not convinced the House. I have to accept that. 
I accept I have not overturned the predetermined collective view of the committee. Uh, I regret that, but it is a reality. But I'm glad I made the points, because I think that there could come a point when this legislation is looked back upon and questions are asked, why did we think it right to create an offence where the law requires an intent to do harm or a recklessness to doing harm? But we decided that you could be guilty of domestic abuse without actually doing harm. I drew the parallel. You wouldn't think you could be convicted of theft without actually stealing. But this House thinks you can be committed, uh, convicted of domestic abuse without causing the harm from such abuse. In that, I respectfully suggest the House is wrong. And I think to do do a disservice to the certainty and sanctity of the criminal law. I'm not going to labour the point, but I'm going to ask the question, what is the mischief that we're trying to address? The mischief surely is that women and men, but women predominantly, are abused. That's why we call the offence domestic abuse. It says it in there. This offence shall be called the domestic abuse offence. And yet we rush our offences to the point where we decide, but you don't actually have to have any abuse in order to be guilty of that offence. And if the direction of travel here is to deal with coercive abuse, then why does this legislation not make an offence of, coerc of coercive abuse? Why is that not the offence? I can understand, I could understand if that's the target, then make it the offence. Make the offence coercive abuse. Have the evidence that that was the intention. And in those circumstances, you could actually lay a path to justifying external evidence that that would be perceived to be coercive abuse. But when you make the offence actual domestic abuse, then you cannot dodge the necessity, I say, of showing there is abuse, there is harm, because otherwise you rise at the ridiculous situation where you invite a jury to convict someone who fails in their intent who fails to cause harm, who fails to cause psychological harm, and you say, nonetheless, convict. And that's why I say I think we are doing despite to the essence of the criminal law and the need for an actus reus and a mens rea. All you have in this offence is mens rea and someone else who's not the victim, but some mythical, reasonable person believing there was an actus reus. That's a bit farcical. But I recognise I have not persuaded the House. I regret that. Uh, but uh, you have your view. I have mine. And in due course, we may see the wisdom of whatever path was trod. Thank you. Amendment proposed to Clause 1, page 1, line 12. Leave out and insert the words printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 1 be made. 
All those in favor say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. I think the no's have it. I think the no's have it. The no's have it. Questions that clause one uh, stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. Aye, aye, aye. Contrary, no. no. All those in favour say aye. Aye, aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clause two. The question is that clause two stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. <clears throat> Before I put the question, um, I'd remind members that we have debated Mr. Allister's opposition to Clause 3, but the question uh, will be put in the positive as usual. So the question is that Clause 3 stand at part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think all those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clause four. The questions that clause four stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clauses five to seven. I propose by leave of the Assembly to group these clauses for the question on stand part. The question is that clauses 5 to 7 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 2 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Justice to formally move Amendment 2. Amendment 2, proposed to clause 8, page 5, line 24, leave out and insert the words printed on the marshal list. The question is that Amendment 2 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. As amended. Yeah. The question is that clause 8, as amended, stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. Amendment 3 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Justice to formally move Amendment 3. I beg to move. Amendment proposed to Clause 9, page 6, line 6. Insert words as printed on the Marshal list. The question is that Amendment 3 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. Amendment 4 has already been debated, and I call Miss Rachel Woods to move formally Amendment 4. So moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 9, page 6, line 8. Insert words as printed on the marshal list. The question is that Amendment 4 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. Question five has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Justice to formally move Amendment five. Not moved, Mr. Speaker. Amendment five not moved by the Minister. Okay. Amendment six has already been debated. I call the Minister of Justice to formally move Amendment six. Not moved. Amendment 6, not moved. So that's me on there. Amendment 7 has already been debated, and I call Miss Rachel Woods to move formally Amendment 7. So moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 9, page 6, line 11. Insert words as printed on the marshal list. The question is that Amendment 7 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. 
The question, the question is that Clause 9, as amended, stand part of the Bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 8 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Justice to formally move Amendment 8. I beg to move. Amendment proposed to Clause 10, page 6, line 38. Leave out and insert words as printed on the marked list. The question is Amendment 8 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that Clause 10, as amended, stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Members, it's been a, a long session already, and I propose by leave of the uh, Assembly to suspend the sitting until 7.15. The sitting is by leave suspended. Okay. Order members, we turn now to the debate, and we now come to the second group of amendments for the debate. With Amendment 9, it will be convenient to debate Amendments 11 to 14. And I call the Minister of Justice to move Amendment 9 and to address the other amendments in the group. Minister. Mr Speaker, I beg to move Amendment 9, which is being brought forward as a consequence of Amendment 12, through which the offence of child cruelty will explicitly cover non-physical ill-treatment of children aged under 16. Clause 11, as it currently stands, provides that the domestic abuse offence does not apply where a person has parental responsibility for someone under 18 years of age. I am proposing an amendment to this clause which will change the age from under 18 years to under 16 years of age. This is to ensure that non-physical abusive behaviour of a 16 to 18 year old by someone with parental responsibility is captured under the new offence. This is necessary given that Section 20 of the Children and Young Persons Act 1968, which is to be amended through Amendment 12 to capture non-physical ill-treatment of a child by someone with parental responsibility for them, only applies to persons under 16 years of age. To do otherwise would mean that those aged 16 to 17 would not be protected in terms of non-physical abusive behaviour. Clause 17 currently provides that an offence cannot be aggravated by reason of involving domestic abuse if the partner or connected person is under 18 and the accused has parental responsibility for them. I am proposing an amendment to this clause, amendment number 11, which will change the age from under 18 years to under 16 years of age. This is for the same reasons I have just set out in the previous amendment. Amendment number 12 inserts a new clause in relation to the definitions for the child cruelty offence. Evidence received by the Justice Committee during their deliberations on the bill highlighted concerns that non-physical abuse of a child by someone with parental responsibility for them was not captured by current child protection provisions. In order to respond to this, I am bringing forward this amendment which will amend the child cruelty offence in Section 20 of the Children and Young Persons Act 1968. This amendment makes it clear that non-physical ill-treatment of a child by someone with parental responsibility for them is an offence. This offence applies to those under the age of 16. It will also provide that references to an offence around unnecessary suffering or injury to a child explicitly state that this relates to the suffering or injury being physical or otherwise, again ensuring that non-physical behaviour is captured in the offence. This will enable matters such as isolation, humiliation, bullying and many others to be captured under this offence. Discussions have been held with the Department of Health on this amendment, with the Health Minister content that this change is being brought forward. While the ill treatment or abuse of a child or young person falls into the child protection arena, what, is it, what it is important to ensure at this point is that the necessary protections are afforded to all of our young people. While we can debate whether or not the child cruelty offence should have a threshold of under 18 as opposed to under 16, it is not possible to provide for this within this bill. Ultimately, my focus is ensuring that abusive behaviour against children can be dealt with through whatever means. 
For this reason, Amendments 9, 11 and 12 make it explicit that the child cruelty offence covers both physical and non-physical ill-treatment of those aged 16 and under, while extending the domestic abuse offence to those aged 16 and 17. Without these three changes being taken forward together, there are not the necessary protections for those aged 16 and 17. A failure of the House to approve Amendments 9 and 11 would mean that protection from abusive behaviour is not afforded to those aged 16 and 17. In relation to these provisions, I would reassure members that we are not criminalising normal family disagreements or parental responsibility. For example, where a young person is grounded, their allowance is removed, or they no longer have access to electronic communications and social media um, because of their behaviour. This would not be within the scope of the offence, with more than sufficient safeguards within legislation to ensure this, given that there are three hurdles that must be passed before the offence occurs. These are that behaviour must be abusive and occur on two or more occasions. A reasonable person would have to consider the behaviour likely to cause harm, and the accused must intend to cause harm or be reckless to this. There is also a defence of behaviour being reasonable in the particular circumstances. Turning now to Amendment 13, a Committee for Justice Amendment. I understand that the Committee has concerns about the introduction of provisions to provide for new domestic abuse protection notices and orders, and that to a certain extent this provision is intended to act as a stopgap in case the necessary legislation is not introduced to provide for these. I have made clear it is my intention that the provision will be made for this in the Justice Mis Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, and therefore I consider this amendment unnecessary. More importantly, explicitly stating a restrictive two-year time frame for the introduction of an untested policy, which has not yet been subject to public consultation, leaves my department exposed to a successful judicial review and unnecessary levels of risk. There are many factors outside our control which could mean that it is not possible to achieve this, particularly important when we consider the current pandemic situation and the impact it has had on how all of us work. There are also significant resource implications to an approach that would deny and require my department to progress through both primary and secondary legislation at the same time. Resources, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we simply do not have. Inclusion in the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill will enable the detail of the provisions to be set out in primary legislation as well as the necessary policy development and consultation to be undertaken ahead of this. And I reassured members of that in my earlier remarks. I consider that these notices and orders will garner much public interest and that it is only right that a full public consultation is undertaken and that this House has the opportunity for the detail to be set out in primary legislation. The approach adopted by the committee amendment would mean regulating into secondary legislation an issue that takes the form of around 35 clauses in Westminster legislation, the extent effectively of a medium-sized bill. I consider that both the Executive and the House should be aware of and pass the broad intent of such expansive provisions in primary legislation, setting out clear authority for any such measures. While the provisions will be brought forward at amendment stage of the miscellaneous provisions bill, due to the stage of policy development that we are at, and will therefore not be subject to the usual committee stage process, I have given my commitment that the Department will engage fully with the Committee on the preparation and progress of these provisions in such a manner as the Committee sees fit, to ensure that they have the appropriate, sc the appropriate scrutiny of these clauses. This approach will also ensure that this House has two opportunities at amending stage to debate the detail of the provisions in the Bill finalisation. For these reasons, I cannot support this amendment and would ask members to support me in resisting it. With respect then to Amendment 14, I would, it would confer a discretionary power on the Legal Services Agency to waive the financial eligibility test in private family law cases in circumstances where the applicant has been the victim of a domestic abuse offence. I am deeply sympathetic to the intention behind Rachel Wood's amendment. It is clearly a laudable aim to ensure that victims of abuse are supported to establish safe and stable arrangements for the care of their children. Nevertheless, I believe there are three important reasons why the approach taken here is not the right one and why I think we should seek to provide this support in another way. Firstly, it is not clear to me that this amendment will provide the right protection for these victims. As a particular example, while a waiver would provide access to legal aid, this would not be free of charge. 
Victims would need to make an upfront contribution to the cost of their representation. Where a victim of abuse is unable to access their resources, where they are being controlled by their abuser, for example, this would leave still a very vulnerable person without representation. Furthermore, a person who is the victim of abuse, but whose abuser has not been convicted of the relevant offence under this bill, would also not be assisted by the proposal. So, for example, if someone was to be convicted under the alternative options available for prosecution, they would not be able to benefit from the proposal. <clears throat> There are a range of protections that might potentially be afforded to victims and a range of circumstances in which they could be made available. I take the, the, best, the view that the best approach to determining the form of protection is by engagement with stakeholders to construct a form of protection that will address the real issues that victims of abuse face. And I agree with the member proposing this amendment that those issues are real and do need to be addressed. Secondly, at present, I am unable to state with confidence what impact this proposed amendment will have on victims of abuse or on the operation of the family courts generally. Neither can I be clear about what its costs might be. Legally, it is a complex and contested area of law and it interacts in complex ways with the experience of people in contact with the civil courts. I believe that research work is still required to understand the likely impact and cost of the protections we offer. It simply doesn't make sense to act hastily by introducing changes with no clear idea of the impact they will have, unless the situation is urgent. And we are not in that st state of urgency because, thirdly, the Department has powers to make secondary legislation providing the protection that is required. Secondary legislation is the appropriate vehicle for technical amendments of this type, and this is not just a question of appropriateness or propriety. By using secondary legislation to provide these powers, we give ourselves the time to engage with stakeholders, understand the most appropriate forms of the protection should take, and we can conduct research so that we fully understand the likely impact and cost of those reforms. Crucially, however, it also means that we can monitor those changes and the impact of them, and act promptly to make changes to the system if it is not having the impact that we want. By putting this provision on the face of primary legislation, we lose each of those opportunities and almost inevitably the people we are trying to help are less protected than they might otherwise be as a result. For these reasons, I cannot support this amendment and would ask members to support me in resisting this. I am committed to work constructively with the Justice Committee to develop subordinate legislation to address this important issue. That concludes my comments at this stage on this group of amendments, Mr Speaker. I now call Paul Given, the Chairperson of the Justice Committee. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And let me cover then the amendments in this group that have been tabled by the Minister and also um, Ms Rachel Woods, MLA, um, before setting out then details of the Committee's proposed amendment. Around Amendments 9, 11 and 12, questions were raised by the Committee by a wide range of organisations, particularly those representing uh, children regarding the fact that the domestic abuse offence does not apply where an individual has parental responsibility for someone under the age of 18 and whether existing uh, children's legislation provides adequate protection for child victims of non-physical abuse. Uh, the committee discussed the position with NSPCC and Bernardo's representatives when they attended uh, to give oral evidence and requested further information and clarification from the Department of Justice officials who indicated that the Department had given careful consideration to the scope of the domestic abuse offence in order to ensure that children could be captured within it uh, in their own right, where they are in a relationship or a family member while preventing criminalisation of parental responsibility. The officials also outlined that having considered the matter further and taking account of the concerns expressed to the Committee, Discussions were taking place with Department of Health officials on a possible amendment to child protection provisions in health legislation to make it clear that non-physical ill-treatment of a child by someone with parental responsibility for them is an offence and to provide that references to an offence around unnecessary suffering or injury to a child explicitly state that this relates to suffering or injury being physical or otherwise, again ensuring that non-physical behaviour is covered. This should enable matters such as isolation, humiliation, bullying, etc. to be captured. 
Amendment 12, the text of which was furnished to the Committee by the Department, provides for this by amending the Child Cruelty Offence in Section 20 of the Children and Young Persons Act of 1968. Uh, when the Department provided the wording of the proposed amendment towards the end of the Committee stage of the Bill, it also advised the Committee that the Child Cruelty Offence only applies to those under the age of 16. And as already explained by the Minister, to ensure that non-physical treatment of those aged 16 and 17 in the context of a parent-child relationship could be provided for in the legislation, the Department was considering reducing the age threshold for the parental responsibility exclusion from under age 18 to under age 16, as provided for in Amendments 9 and 11. While concerned about the gap that the amendment to the child cruelty offence, if made, would cause, the Committee viewed the proposed remedy of reducing the age threshold for the parental responsibility exclusion as a significant change and did not believe that it was in a position to clearly understand the implications or consequences of making it without the input and views of key stakeholders and further time to consider and discuss the issue. The Department did seek the views of the NSPCC and the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People. Uh, to try and assist the committee, but neither commented directly on the proposal to reduce the age threshold, remaining of the view that children should be wholly captured within the domestic abuse offence and the parental responsibility exclusion should not apply. The committee accepts that child protection legislation falls to the Department of Health and therefore supports, supports the approach taken in the bill uh, to the scope of the offence. The committee also believes that the law should be robust and clear regarding the position of non-physical ill treatment or injury to a child under the age of 16 and is therefore content to support the amendment to the child cruelty offence. The committee sought but did not uh, have sufficient information to properly consider the proposal by the department to reduce the age threshold for the parental responsibility exclusion from under age 18 to under age 16 before the committee stage of the bill was due to be completed. Therefore, the Committee noted the proposed amendments to Clauses 11 and 17. The Committee advised the Department that it expected it to ensure that the gap created for 16- and 17-year-olds, assuming the amendment to the child cruelty offence was made, was fully addressed and indicated that it would consider any further information provided on the implications or consequences of the Department's proposed remedy and or any other options available to address the issue. The Department Subsequently advised, that the committee, subsequently advised the committee that it did not consider there is any other options to address this gap in the context of the domestic abuse bill, and therefore the minister intended to bring forward the amendments to clauses 11 and 17 to change the age from under 18 years to under 16 years of age to ensure that the non-physical abuse of a 16 or 17-year-old by someone with parental responsibility is captured by the new offence. The Department also indicated that any wider changes in this area would be the responsibility of the Department of Health, and it understood that no further changes are being considered at this stage. With the attendance of the Minister at the Committee meeting last Thursday, these amendments were discussed further, following which the Committee agreed that it was content to support them to ensure the gap is addressed. However, the committee is of the view that this is a suboptimal solution and there will be uh, work to be done going forward with the Department of Health to ensure there is better alignment across the board in these areas. On Amendment 14, uh, Ms Wood's amendment relating to the eligibility requirement for legal aid, the committee has not had an opportunity to consider and reach a position on this uh, and therefore uh, I will address this later, speaking in a personal capacity, as the committee did not take a position on it. Um, my colleague Paul Frew uh, will elaborate in more detail the DUP position in respect of Amendment 14. Uh, on Amendment 13, uh, which the Justice Committee has brought forward to provide for measures to protect and support victims and alleged victims of domestic violence and abuse, the Minister has already outlined her objections to this amendment. And I now want uh, to set out the reasons why the committee has brought it forward and the rationale for framing it in the way that we have. As the Assembly has already heard, the Department of Justice took legislative powers to provide for domestic violence protection notices and orders similar to those in England and Wales in the Justice Northern Ireland Act in 2015. However, due to a number of reasons, the Department has never introduced them. 
These are now being replaced in England and Wales by new domestic abuse protection notices and orders by way of provisions in the Westminster Domestic Abuse Bill. The new notices and orders will address the broader definition of domestic abuse that is being introduced there and make other changes to address some of the operational shortcomings that were experienced in relation to the old style notice and orders. In the evidence received by the committee on this bill, recognition of the limitations of the old style notices and orders and support instead for the introduction of domestic abuse protection notices and orders came from a range of organisations, including statutory bodies, advocacy groups and trade unions who highlighted that they will soon be available in England and Wales. While some of the organisations noted that the Department was considering uh, progressing this matter in a future piece of legislation, others believed the issue should be covered in this bill. The 2019 Criminal Justice Inspection Northern Ireland the thematic report on the handling of domestic violence and abuse cases by the criminal justice system in Northern Ireland urged progress on the issue of protection notices. The Northern Ireland Policing Board, having benchmarked with England and Wales through police performance monitoring with regards to domestic violence and abuse, is also of the view that there is considerable merit in the introduction of domestic abuse protection notices and orders, and would support this within legislation. The chairperson of the Northern Ireland Policing Board Performance Committee also recently wrote to the Justice Committee, highlighting that the Performance Committee had considered police performance against measures within the annual 2020-21 performance plan with a focus on repeat victims, repeat offenders and the delivery of effective crime outcomes in relation to domestic violence and abuse. The Performance Committee had discussed a potential gap in legislative provisions in relation to the bill in front of us today to provide for domestic abuse protection notices and orders and how this could impact on the police's ability to further protect victims and ask the committee for an update on progress in this area. The committee did seek the views of the PSNI on the potential benefits for victims of domestic abuse of such orders. In its response, the police highlighted concerns that it had, that it had regarding the old-style domestic violence protection notices and orders that are currently in operation in England and Wales, and which the Department was continuing to work towards here in Northern Ireland, and suggested that rather than introducing these, further formal consultation in determining the most effective way ahead in Northern Ireland would be beneficial. In August, the Department advised the Committee that it was looking at proposals for the introduction of domestic abuse protection notices and orders and due to the policy and operational lead-in time required, this would be taken forward at the amendment stage of the proposed miscellaneous provisions bill, justice bill. The Minister subsequently advised the Committee in September that given the concerns expressed by the statutory and voluntary and community sector bodies during discussions and the issues evident from England and Wales, she did not believe that the old-style domestic violence protection notices and orders should be introduced in Northern Ireland, and instead the Department would focus on policy development in relation to the new domestic abuse protection notices and orders. Suffice to say, Mr Deputy Speaker, it has been a long, drawn-out process by the Department to get us to this point. The Committee recognises the benefits of domestic abuse protection notices and orders in terms of providing short-term protection to victims for a period of time after an incident and giving them time and space to consider their next steps. The Committee also understands there is a need to develop the policy in this area and identify the most appropriate option for Northern Ireland. Members are, however, concerned and frustrated about the length of time Northern Ireland has already been without any form of these protection notices, and we do not find any reassurance in the fact that legislative provision in this area is only going to be advanced by the Department during the progression of the proposed Justice Bill. In order to ensure progress is made, the Committee agreed to bring forward Amendment 13 to place a duty on the Minister to provide for a scheme within 24 months of commencement of this legislation for the purposes of protecting and supporting victims or alleged victims of domestic abuse. Rather than being prescriptive, the amendment provides for the details of such a scheme to be set out in regulations, thus enabling the Department to identify and progress the most appropriate scheme for Northern Ireland. The Minister advised the Committee on 1 November that she considers that the amendment is unnecessary and she has set out her reasons for this today. 
Let me be clear, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Committee could have taken the detailed provisions in the Westminster Bill relating to domestic abuse protection notices and orders and brought them forward as amendments to this Bill. However, we are aware that Scotland also intends to introduce a form of protected, protective orders for people at risk of domestic abuse. The Committee wants to provide the Department with the opportunity to develop the most appropriate policy option for Northern Ireland. Therefore, rather than being prescriptive in this Bill and setting out a particular approach or simply lifting a scheme wholesale from another jurisdiction, the Committee amendment deliberately gives flexibility by providing for the details of court orders or measures other than court orders to be set out in regulations. Turning to the timescale of 24 months from the commencement of this Bill, in our view, this is entirely reasonable, particularly given that the Department advised the Committee back in August that it was already considering proposals for domestic abuse protection notices and orders. So while the Committee notes the Minister's stated intention to make provision in the proposed Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, as I outlined earlier, the Committee does not find reassurance in that position, particularly as the intention is to do so during the amending stages of the Bill, rather than at introduction. And until we see the proposed provisions and indeed the bill being introduced, there is no guarantee that legislative provision in this area will be available. The committee therefore sees no reason not to take the opportunity to provide legislative provision within this bill. The minister recently advised the committee that she hopes to bring forward the miscellaneous provisions bill in March 2021. And if that takes place, and the Department introduces relevant provisions for domestic abuse protection notices and orders, or something similar at the amending stage, then the Department can also repeal the Committee's provision in this Bill, assuming it is made as it will not be necessary, and we would be content with that approach. However, if for whatever reason the Department is unable to either progress the miscellaneous provisions bill or bring forward provisions for domestic abuse protection notices and orders during its passage through the Assembly, the Committee Amendment today will provide a legislative basis on which to progress this issue within a reasonable time frame. If we do not take the opportunity provided by this bill to put this in place, there is the possibility that progress in this area may not take place until a new Assembly mandate which is totally unacceptable given the length of time Northern Ireland has already been without this type of scheme. The Committee fails to understand then the Minister's lack of support for the approach that we are taking and her assertion that it places the Department at considerable risk of successful, successful judicial review if the timescale of 24 months cannot be met, particularly given her commitment that she is bringing forward provisions as part of the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, which will be well within that timescale. So I would therefore ask the Assembly to support the Committee Amendment that we have before the Assembly today, and I am happy to give way to the Minister. Um, I am happy to elucidate on the reasons that there could be problems. This is an untried and untested policy. There has been no public consultation. There has not been the opportunity, therefore, for us to shape um, the domestic abuse protection notices. And whilst I share the frustration of the committee at the domestic violence protection notices not being able to be proceeded with in a more timely fashion. The risk is that if we go out to consultation and there are significant issues with the operation um, of domestic abuse protection notices in other jurisdictions that emerge or significant resistance to um, the introduction of domestic abuse protection notices um, during that consultation, that we would be considered to have acted um, in a way that was not taking account of those who had responded if we are already committed in law to undertaking a course of action. Thank you, Minister, for, for that intervention. And I'm not going to repeat all of the rationale that the committee considered, because that's exactly what I'd be doing, because I've already addressed that. Of course, the Minister will be winding on this group, and she'll be capable of, I'm sure, adding more detail to it. But the position, as I've outlined on behalf of the committee, um, has already been stated on the record. Speaking very briefly in a personal capacity, my colleague Paul Frew is here. He, he will address Amendment 14 in more detail. Suffice to say, as the Minister has outlined, um, there is a lot of sympathy and indeed support for the rationale behind the intended purpose uh, to this amendment. I know the Minister has outlined in her comments some concern that there would still be upfront costs to in, in terms of the impact on victims, even if this amendment was to be a, a approved, um, and indeed has highlighted some concerns around costs. 
Um, my colleague, Mr. Frew, of course, will, will deal with this. Uh, those may be areas that, at further consideration stage, if this amendment was to be passed, um, that, that could potentially address some of the concerns that the Minister has outlined. But certainly, uh, as far as the DUP is concerned, we are very much sympathetic to the intended purpose uh, that the member has uh, brought forward by way of Amendment 14. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, at that point, um, I'm content to take my place. I call Pat Sheehan. Yeah, uh, and I welcome the opportunity to speak at this debate today. I was on the 